where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. Y'all like my African queen thing I got going on? <laughs> this is like the fourth hairstyle I didn't try for this video. Listen, would y'all believe me if I told y'all that I have spent months working on this video? Which is crazy because voting as an issue is not my thing. I do not canvas for any parties or politicians. I don't have no buttons, no stickers, no posters. I don't donate to anybody. And I have not made a dollar on the making of this video. I will not make any money off of this video. Nobody asks me to make this video. You'll notice you find no ads on this video or any of my videos as it stands. And I say all that to you because a lot of people who are pushing things to you re-voting or anti-voting are getting a check and they have an agenda. And I am not getting a check but I do have an agenda and I wanna be very transparent with you about what that agenda is. If you know me already, you probably know me from my work as a public defender in New York City and as an advocate for abolition, bail reform, notably in New York City and Illinois, or for my general advocacy against policing and police brutality and for the black community and for other marginalized groups. Or maybe you know me from my writing or some viral clip or Raheem. <laughs> or maybe you discovered me for the first time right here on YouTube. And if so, I love that. Hey, y'all. But how I define myself is as a movement lawyer or a professional loudmouth, as I usually say. And it's what it sounds like. I'm a lawyer who works in furtherance of movements. And I do that by working with different communities, organizations, and individuals nationwide to fight in favor of things they need, like the Pretrial Fairness Act and Solitary Confinement Act saving bail reform and ending cash bail. What's important to me is the liberation of black people, which requires the liberation of all marginalized people and freedom from capitalism, patriarchy, and the prison industrial complex. So I work in furtherance of that goal. The first thing that we need to understand today, which I will expand on later in this video, is that change is made by the people, not the government. And two, all governments, all governments are oppositional forces resisting change. That's why we call our efforts a resistance. So to do the work I do, to do any work that's about changing the status quo, the people must fight against the government. Who the government is has a lot to do with how difficult that fight will be. The work I do, how hard I have to fight, shoots. Whether I'm able to fight at all has a lot to do with who's in office. Whether we have a Republican or Democrat administration drastically impacts whether I'm able to do the advocacy I do, whether the movements that I support are able to pass laws or save the ones that we've already passed, like the landmark bail reform that took effect in New York City in 2020, or the Pretrial Fairness Act that was just implemented in Illinois after surviving a round of attacks from Republicans, making Illinois the first state to abolish cash bail. The increasing popular sentiment I see growing in my online spaces is that Democrats and Republicans are the same, and thus voting doesn't matter, or worse, that people shouldn't vote. And that troubles me, because of what the consequences of people believing that and acting accordingly would mean for the work I do and the goal I'm working towards. Listen to me, and listen to me good. In my, Olaya means, heart and soul, I don't give a personal f about Joe Biden, Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump, Marianne Williamson, Cornel West, RFK, or anybody else running for president. I am not friends with any of them. I don't campaign for none of them. I don't donate to none of them. And I'm not personally offended or moved by your support or disapproval for any of them. I am indifferent about politicians and I see them all as the adversaries of the people. So I just want the weakest adversary in power unless and until they assert themselves as either a major threat or obstacle to my goals. I want you to know right now specifically to the other commentators and media folk that will see this and want to make angry videos and reactions on behalf of whatever politician they support or deem that I support. Baby, I do not care, okay? I don't care about none of that, and I am not going to respond. I'm not going to be moved by it. I put a lot of work into ensuring that I feel confident standing 10 toes down behind everything I say today, so Godspeed, knock yourselves out, okay? So that's my agenda and the lens I'm shooting from today and a lot of what motivated me to embark on making this video, which I'm thinking of as Olay's election survival guide. The other reason I embarked on this project was simply because people are often assuming and projecting a lot onto me re-voting, and they're usually real angry when they do it. Okay, it's that football fandom thing where people engage with politics the way they would football and they be going dumb hard when you say anything because there are two sides. It's the who are right and the who are wrong, and baby, if you're not the who are right, then you are the who are wrong. So what often happens is I criticize the Democrats and someone goes, the Republicans are worse. Why don't you criticize them? And I go, 
Yeah, I know. I know that. And I do. Then someone else goes, what? The Democrats and the Republicans are the same, you shit lib. And then someone who thinks that they're so left, they're far right, goes, both of you are shit lib, latte, liberal, hot take, hot take, straight from the press. The Democrats are worse than the Republicans, actually. Yes, <laughs> milk toast, shit lib, shill, grifter, tanky. White uh, supremacy puppets. White supremacy puppets. And it's so funny because you'll be all those things to the same people. Like I am both, I am both a shit lib and a tanky. <laughs> so I'm both, I am both too moderate for the left and too extreme for the left, depending on who you talk to. You know what I'm saying? I've been doing abortion rights. I've been extremely online doing abortion rights for 11 years. 11 years and all the same kinds of people calling me a shit lib now were the same kinds of people patting me on the head and saying, oh, Roe is fine. It is a never ending cycle of people being mad as f about every Jesus little thing that usually devolves into people calling you a vote blue no matter who shit lib. If you haven't decided that one of the third party candidates is the answer we've all been waiting on, which is funny to me for a few reasons, because one, that the people who think that there's some kind of revolutionary juxtaposed to you, the shit lib, because they've decided to also put their faith in some politician or party to liberate them or radically change the system they're running to be a part of. And listen, I assure you that the real revolutionaries understand that no politician, government, or system actor is going to bring about your liberation or do all or even most of what the people, the people want done. Two, I am not a US citizen. So I can't even vote, let alone vote blue no matter who. Plus, actual liberals would probably call me a radical extremist, police hating bitch, and on most given days, I'm probably criticizing the Democrats, specifically my arch nemesis, New York City Mayor Eric Adams, and his partner in evil, Governor Kathy Hochul. I also get heat from folk who are anti-voting or voting for a third party candidate, which confuses me a little because I've never blown down on either group. Generally, I think if you can vote, you should, but that doesn't mean I have any real smoke for non-voters. You don't see me tweeting no angry shit about how y'all are to blame for 2016 or something. And listen, I, I do not personally believe that any of the third party presidential runs are going to accomplish any of the things the people that are gun ho supporting them believe that they will, or that being gun ho behind these campaigns is a productive use of your time for reasons that I'll flesh out later. But that does not mean that I believe anyone who is or wants to vote that way is wrong, morally irreprehensible, or my enemy. I am fully capable of not sharing your sentiments on the topic of voting or not believing in your voting strategy or what you think will happen by abstaining or voting third party without that meaning that we are not both genuinely committed to the underlying motivation to get us to a less oppressed place. Okay, so we're gonna have a little bit of an editor's note in real time here from what I have here on my script. Because I was going to say, I'm not gonna lie to y'all, my first and in general internal response to people saying that voting doesn't matter, or that Democrats and Republicans are the same, and to the people really dragging it, saying Democrats are worse than Republicans is, wow, these wackadoodle really think we're in the upside down. But I actually have changed. Let me let me divert a little bit in real time from what I have on the script because I would not feel right having the same level. I still am going to ultimately make an argue, make the argument that Democrats and Republicans are not the same for my purposes or at least in substantive ways that I think do matter in terms of us as a left trying to get to a more progressive place. But I wanna be clear that there are many ways that they are the same. And I think that everything happening right now in terms of the U.S. response to what's happening in Israel and um, with Israel and Palestine and, and Gaza, I feel like it would be arrogance, sheer arrogance and arrogance to come here with the same level of flippant disregard to the people that think that Democrats and Republicans are the same. OK, so um, I just want to be clear about that. Back to the script. So my original, that was why I came into this video. My internal response was, that's ridiculous. But genuinely, I saw those kind of arguments enough from people who follow me and people that like me that I wanted to at least try to be thoughtful and not just write off everyone without at least first picking the brains of people I respect. And that quest has revealed a lot to me that I'm going to share with y'all. But what I really want to cement in our heads right out the gate that I think a lot of the other talking heads are not willing to say is that there is no one right answer, take, or strategy as it pertains to voting. Voting, what candidate or party is better or what you should do voting-wise, 
depends entirely on who you are, where you are, how it impacts you, what matters to you, what you know, and what you think you know. I say who you are because voters are really malleable and hard to pin down. And I, I, I have this perspective because this is kind of how my family has always been. Like my family has always gone from Republican to Democrat uh, and now back to, you know, being as left as I can make them because I will nag them until they they shut the f about Republicans. You know, it always depends. They kind of they go based on vibes and narratives. So like my dad, he supported George H.W. Bush, loved him. And it was all because of the way that he handled the Panama War, which he handled it like dog shit. Um, but my dad liked it. But then he hated Clinton because Clinton did welfare reform and my family relied on welfare at that time in particular. Uh, but then my family supported Obama because Obama had a really good working class message. And even though my family was socially conservative, my dad in particular was really sensitive to any racist politics. Uh, so he hated Donald Trump, hated the uh, xenophobia that he saw from Donald Trump, um, liked Bernie Sanders because of the economic policy. So they kind of like, they, they, they're really mushy. They go all over the place and I kind of like I take my family's political views and I project that onto the rest of the country, uh, you know, for better or worse. And these are folks that just like, you have to try to meet them where they are and talk to them. And you'll see that they're kind of all over the place and hard to pin down. And the candidate who has the best narrative is I think gonna be the one that prevails. I say where you are because. The entire election comes down to about six states. And if you don't live in one of those six states, then you really don't, you're not that much a part of the process. Yeah. So we shouldn't, so, so we have to make strategic decisions about where to invest our political capital. And I say what you think you know, because take for example, rapper Sexy Red, saying that she supports Donald Trump because she and other black people thought he was racist until he gave us stimulus checks. Do you think more people are gonna support Trump now in the hood like or Trump. no? Yeah, they support him in the hood. Cause at first I don't think <laughs> people was with him like they thought he was racist, saying little shit and you know, against women. But once he started getting black people out of jail and giving people their free money, Oh, baby, we love Trump. We need him back in office. Yeah, that, a little bit of free money goes a long way. We huh? need him back. Because, yeah, baby, yeah, them we, checks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, them stimulus checks, Trump. We miss you. She supports Donald Trump because she thinks she knows that he gave the people stimulus checks. What she doesn't know is that while we may have gotten those checks during Trump's administration, the Republicans voted against it. Every Republican voted against it. And Democrats are who got us that money. And because there are a lot of different ways to think about voting this election, elections in general, I just didn't think it would be valuable for this kind of video to only hear my perspective. So I'm going to be offering my personal perspectives to the people who might find that valuable throughout this video, intertwined with the perspectives of friends and mentors and people whose thought processes I value, and maybe some new and familiar faces to all of you, because as one of those friends put it to me, for some people, the administrations do feel the same. What I find with the Democratic Party is that while we fight them on different things, we're still fighting them tooth and nail. My One of my biggest political lessons came from uh, drug user activist Carl Stubbs um, in 2016 when Trump was elected, crying. And I'm like, oh my God, the world's gonna fall apart. And you know, this is an older black man who's been it, you know, dealing with the drug war for a really long time. And he's like, baby girl, nothing changes for me. And nothing ever changes. For me, my life has changed because I got student loan forgiveness. I wasn't getting that under Trump, right? You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't getting that from the conservative party, but my life has diametrically changed because I no longer have this educational debt. And for me, I was like, shit, I don't care what you do. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'll see you in November, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My dad, immigrant, came into New York City, did what the immigrants do. They all pulled their, their resources together. They got a medallion. They had a taxi. The taxi business is gone. You can't convince my dad to vote now because to him, he feels like the Dems and the Republicans abandoned him, right? Because his material conditions shifted because the most important thing to him, his retirement, his livelihood, changed and he didn't get 
and he, nobody spoke to it. So this is going to be a very long video, but I promise that it's going to be a good one that I am really proud of y'all because I put a lot of effort into not just hearing my own thoughts reverberate off the walls and to try to hear, think about and extract what I find valuable from the perspectives of many people who I respect. And so with that in mind, there are two things that I specifically want y'all to bear in mind as you watch this video. One, take what you find valuable and discard the rest. And two, that someone's perspective is just that, their perspective, which is shaped by their identity, their life experiences, and where they stand in relation to what they're assessing. So it is not always going to mirror your own, and that does not make it innately bad or something that you need to fight or change or try to beat the person into submission about. When you listen to what different people have to say about voting or really anything, consider their vantage point, the perspective that they're coming from so you can better understand their thought process and the context to see if there is anything valuable that you can take from it at all and to discard the rest. One of the primary ways that I personally think through issues in my life is by talking to people whose opinions and perspectives I respect. Notice that I didn't say whose opinions and perspectives I share, just respect. And I pick their brains on topics. And I really find so much grounding in how often I call someone up, usually my mentor, Masai. There's nothing wrong with someone running as a third party. The question is, what are you running? Why are you running? And how is this part of a long-term strategy? Because you're not gonna win. Tell him what I think about something and having him blow me away with some perspective I hadn't thought of that doesn't usually invalidate what I'd initially thought. It just provides me with an additional valuable thought that I hadn't considered because I likely couldn't consider it. I don't sit atop the same vantage point as my mentor and vice versa. This might come as a surprise to all of us, but we are not capable of having thought about every issue from every perspective all by our lonesome no matter how intelligent or thoughtful we think ourselves to be. But this is critical to how I process information and derive value and harmony in relationships with people that I have the benefit of learning from. I take what I find valuable and I discard the rest. And that is something sorely, sorely, sorely missing from the internet, social media, and the way these political audiences consume information. So many people are watching not to try to learn anything or to see if they're being offered something valuable. They are watching to have their existing sentiments and perspectives echoed. And when it's not, they discard the entirety of what's said or they expect someone to push back or argue someone down where it isn't always necessary. And listen, I am not exempt from that. I realized a few years ago that I had to pay extra attention to prevent Twitter from frying my brain. I even remember the moment I realized it. I think it was 2020 or 2021. And I was reading a book called Why Don't We Riot? A Black Man in Trump Land by Isaac J. Bailey, an award-winning South Carolina journalist. And it's a great book that I recommend you read and I recommend you follow Isaac. But I was reading his book and I remember internally skinning up my face, skinning up my face, that's screaming for this. Some kind of skinning up my face, not because he'd said anything wrong, but because he was doing exactly what the f he told me he was going to do in the title. Speak to the perspective of a black man in Trump land, living in the Bible Belt of America, who interacted with Southern whites, who grew up where he said the only two things that were prominent was Christian churches on every block and monuments honoring the people who fought to keep black people enslaved. So that's a perspective that would obviously not be my own, a black woman from the Bahamas who immigrated to America and practices law in New York City. Why would it be, you goofy bitch? And it's me, I'm the goofy bitch. So I realized that social media, more specifically Twitter, had quietly changed how we consume information. Instead of trying to learn by taking what I could use and leaving the rest, I was doing precisely the opposite. I was trying to extract what I didn't like and leave the rest, which is what quote tweeting is. Twitter ratios and the stardom itself is made of. And that's the opposite of how we learn, or at least it's the opposite of how I was taught to learn as an academic. And when I internally checked that my brain was frying like egg on a pan, I was able to derive so much value from Isaac's perspective and appreciate his work because I was allowing it to be his work rather than expecting it to embody who I am, what I've experienced and what I believe. And I shared that story because I really wanted to emphasize that because I talked to a lot of people whose perspectives I respect for this video because I have the benefit of knowing and having access to a lot of incredibly intelligent people who enlighten me all the time. And I wanted to take advantage of that for your benefit, my audience. But I know 
I know that the minute I say I respect the perspectives of the people I included in my video, some drama monger and unproductive clown pause the video to go through the list of everyone in the video to pick them apart or reduce them to something like a shit lib or a latte liberal or whatever the f they be talking about. And then they're gonna go, this is your queen, is this your queen? She respects such and such, oh, she's a liberal corporate duality Democrat hacker. And it's me, I'm your pure leftist overlord and savior super in the basement, but yeah. But yeah, so anyway, this is me offering you those perspectives for you to take what you find valuable and discard the rest. This is not a one size fits all thing and it's unproductive for us to go into every voting discussion expecting everyone to share the exact same one right take in regard to voting elections and third parties when we are all coming at it from entirely different places with entirely different interests with entirely different things that matter to us. So what I want to say to people out there, out the gate, is regardless of what I think about how you exercise your choices, I think you have a right to choice and I'm not going to be on your neck about it, even if I can't endorse it personally. In a representative democracy, people have choice and I'm not just talking about reproductive choice because I know for some people that's where choice stops. They don't want people to have choice and thoughts about who they want to vote for, whether it's federal, state, regional, or local. Now, I might not rock with the person you want to vote for. I might think it's asinine as hell for you to vote for who you told me you want to vote for. But it is not my place to tell you who to vote for. Now, I can explain to you, try to win you over to who I might be voting for if we had that kind of conversation. But I'm not about to down you because you made a different choice. And for that reason, understand that I am not invested in shaming anyone into voting or shaming anyone for not voting. And it's hard to shame people into voting. I don't think shaming people into voting works. You can try and be like, you better vote or, you know, the country's effed. That doesn't really work in, in my experience. So listen, ultimately I'm glad that there seemed to be this disconnect between what I think about voting and all the people who want to beat my ass for thinking it's worthwhile because it made me want to make this video and it's provided me a great opportunity to tell y'all a little about myself just so you could understand why I'm bothering to make it, why I believe what I believe. And so you can better determine whether it matters to you what I think, whether my perspective is one you value at all, because it might not be. And to really flesh up my thoughts and explore the importance and purpose of voting in federal and more importantly, state and local elections, whether our votes matter, and the material differences between when black people and white people say that Democrats and Republicans are the same, why people feel disenchanted with the Democrats voting third party, how Republicans are successfully plummeting us into fascism, anti-voting propaganda, and how it's specifically being aimed at black people, and you know, just major issues that are impacting voters, American voters, like the Supreme Court, immigration, the climate crisis, LGBTQ rights, reproductive rights, crime, policing, and more. And I am not saying that I still don't think a whole lot of you are some wackadoodle for thinking voting matters is controversial. I am just saying that I decided to go on a thoughtful intellectual exploration before I moved my internal commentary about y'all being wackadoodle niggas to the external. I was reading and thinking about Marcus Garvey when it finally dawned on me how I could best articulate to you why I'm even bothering to be a proponent of voting when so many of you feel that voting doesn't matter or that abstaining from voting is the way to go. Marcus Garvey said, quote, any sane man, race or nation that desires freedom must first of all think in terms of blood. There can be no remission of sins. Then how in the name of God with history before us do we expect to redeem Africa without preparing ourselves, some of us, to die? For over 300 years, the white man has been our oppressor and he naturally is not going to liberate us to the higher freedom, the truer liberty, the truer democracy. We have to liberate ourselves, end quote. But he also cautioned, quote, mob violence and injustice have never helped a race or a nation, end quote. What Garvey was saying is that he believed that black people would only be free when we freed ourselves, when we accepted the inevitability of bloodshed, that some of us would have to die in war for us to free ourselves, because that is what every other nation or people who've ever freed themselves throughout history has done. But he didn't expect that he would. He also said, quote, the political readjustment of the world means that those who are not sufficiently able, not sufficiently prepared, will be at the mercy of the organized classes for another one or 200 years. And that told me something very important. Marcus Garvey would not be surprised that where we, 
black people find ourselves today just 83 years after his death. He wholeheartedly believed that black people would only be free when we freed ourselves through organized violence. And he thought that today's predicament would be likely in the next 100 or 200 years from the time he predicted it. Yet, he never tried to organize us to violence and lead that revolution. But he continued to educate, write, he founded organizations, he inspired people, he globalized Pan-Africanism, and he engaged in political resistance in significant other ways. But he didn't burn it all down. And what I take from that is despite Garvey's belief that there was only one true path to freedom, violent revolution, it did not mean that he believed he was the person capable of carrying it out. It did not make it his role to play. He showed up in the ways that he could. He used the tools that he could that were and continue to be valuable in our collective struggle. The way I see it, there are two roads to be taken. Revolution or civic engagement. Unless I am prepared to advocate for violence, pick up arms, lose my life, become a political prisoner and everything else that comes along with truly choosing revolution and deciding you want to carry out some radical or violent overthrow of the government, there is no reason for me to sit up here and present myself like some kind of revolutionary. The real revolutionaries, people like George Jackson, who studied guerrilla warfare and really tried to organize people, died political prisoners, lost brothers, or Joshua Williams, who was in prison for eight years for setting a trash can on fire at a Ferguson protest in 2014. If you are not prepared to possibly face those kinds of outcomes, please be terribly honest with yourself and resist the urge to cosplay as people who are really about that life. You can still be incredibly valuable and transformative in the ways that you were meant to show up, in the role meant for you. And that's on the other road, the civic engagement road. And if you choose to take that road, the one that already isn't the one true genuine path to freedom, you have a million tools to try to change or resist oppressive systems. And voting is but one. But the least you can do is use or encourage the use of every tool at our disposal. I'm like, man, obviously I don't believe that voting is the end all be all. Because I can't even vote. I obviously believe that there are other things that it needs to be voting and plus. Because you see me doing the and plus all year round. That's what I'm doing to you all the time. But if you, the way I see it, to me there are two paths. There's revolution. You're going to go be a revolutionary and burn it all down per se. Hey, hey, I no bricks. I, ex exactly. And I, of our viewers don't got lights. No, ex oh, <laughs> yes. So shut the f up. <laughs> <laughs> Call no. the Damn. Sorry. When everybody want to get up on stage and rah rah, you know, so everybody want to be Suge Knight at at the Source Awards, but like nobody got the bricks. That's what I'm and, saying. And and, and 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 you can't, you shouldn't be getting your bricks from YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Not exactly. Like, so it's it's a lot of that. Yeah. Like, do you think the real like if I'm like, do you understand what comes along with being somebody that actually acts? Actually says they're going to burn it all down. That person is not on your YouTube with colorful thumbnails and on your Twitter oh, and get a break. Yeah. <laughs> you you know, uh, shout out to I don't remember this dude's name. I kind of don't like him, but he right. That's the best way I could describe him. He does. He's done a couple of videos. Somebody just tagged me in this newest one, but his critiques are on point. And one of the things he talks about in one of these videos, he's like, why does why did so many socialist movements end up in dictatorships and things like that, right? Is he points out that there is a fundamental conflict between the people who end up leading socialist movements and the people they're leading, and that the people who end up leading are almost always academics and children of the petite bourgeoisie. And there's this, this uh, fetishization of working regular people that makes it fundamentally impossible for them to effectively organize with them. And they end up being leaders because they have access to the, to the, um, to the levers of power that put you in that position. And then once they get there, they can't handle or manage that, uh, that effectively. And watch the video. I don't know if you don't put the whole thing here. Cause I'll, I'll probably bastardize the shit. But the point <laughs> I'm getting to is that 
there is a the problem of uh, one of the problems about the visible left, the visible yeah. and very online left. Yes. Because the thing you understand is that the left you don't see is the real left. That's what I've been, that is a conversation I've been having in general, but the difference between the very, what is a very black left in real life in terms of versus our online left or what is vocal. Right, right. The the real left is not going to be here on YouTube too tough. They, you know, but the, but the problem is the visible real left is very much a petite bourgeois um, project. Yeah. And there is an inherent, and I, I say this from experience, there's an inherent, inherent insecurity with the role we embody within these politics as part of the problem and those who will have to sacrifice uh our class position in order to to um realize the goals we we put in, we, we put forth yeah. and so what happens is there's this this cosplaying of revolutionary there's yes. people that want to prove that they're more radical and revolutionary than their class position dictates and what it ends up doing is invisibilizing and marginalizing the real problems that regular people face. Regular Absolutely. people will be affected by a Republican administration versus a Democrat administration. Yes. Period. Yes. I, I think that people romanticize and sensationalize revolution or romanticize sensationalize liberation. And it's just like, hey, listen, man, that all or nothing idea you have is very parasitic and violent and dangerous to people. You feel me? It's like, hey, if, 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 if we can acknowledge that the way in which you get food stamps, the way in which the roads are hit, the way in which your kids get old books or new books, you feel me? The way in which your community is police, all these you usually come down to a question of voting. I say that to say I know who I am and I need y'all to know who I am not. It is cute to be a little Delulu from time to time, but I think sometimes these internet town squares need a reality check. My name is Olaya Mio-Luren, and I am a movement lawyer, political commentator, writer, and national advocate for abolition, bail reform, black liberation, and other social justice movements. And I believe in my heart that that is incredibly valuable work, necessary work that I am proud of. And it likely does make me a radical, but it does not make me a revolutionary. And that is okay. That is not a knock to me. Man, I'm gonna go with civic engagement. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on and say, I think that there's been a concerted effort to demonize civic engagement all the way around. Damn man, I would say in 2023, you just call civic engagement or education around civic engagement or trying to empower, inspire people to be a part of the policy making system or even learn policy making, you write it off as being woke. Oh, you trying to do X, Y, and Z. That's to me. I think that's 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 what it is. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about like, man, I'm I'm 32 years old. I graduated high school in 2009. When Barack Obama won office, or when I be, or or when I people in my class became more politically astute, I'll say when they started talking about George Bush taking away food stamps. That's the first time I'm being real. That's the first time I thought paying attention to paying attention. I'm, I'm born and raised on food stamps, so I'm thinking about how the goalposts change. It went from being like, hey, don't complain. Don't, 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 don't complain or talk about politics if you don't get involved. And then we've seen record high numbers of black people getting involved and we've seen the goalposts kind of change and making it where people get criminalized for getting involved. For me, I look at it like this, man. If you know that, I want to say, I'm, 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 try, I'm trying to keep in mind what we're talking about, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> them, them, uh, them, man, community guidelines be traded. So listen, if you know black people, I want to say the N word, but if you know black people, three times more likely to go to jail. You don't see a sheriff in your county jail. The county sheriff is an elected position. So if you know black people have the more likely a chance of going to jail and going to a county jail uniquely, don't you think we should be able to pick, you feel me? Even if you think they slave master, colonizer, you get to pick it. Exactly. And I ain't saying you're not going to be a colonizer. Pick, pick the best colonizer you can find. Pick the best slave master you can find. It does not negate, though, that this right here is going to be ran this way. And recognize that a lot of places, especially down south, the sheriff don't even get, don't even have no opponent. I am big on self-awareness, and I have never liked that we academics, lawyers, journalists, YouTubers, middle class and upper middle class, and petite bourgeoisie, talented 10th ass feeling like we need to pretend to be something else, that we need to posture like we the real in the trenches and adopt positions that are so senselessly privileged or harmful to the who are actually in the trenches. 
And I haven't seen more of that than what I've seen and how some folks are talking about this election. So I wanna speak quickly to a few arguments I'm not going to be breathing life into in this video. And that's anti-voting slash voting is legitimizing the state, accelerationism and breaking the corporate duopoly. First, anti-voting. First of all, when I say anti-voting, I am not talking about voter apathy or even so much individual people deciding they're not going to vote or that they can't vote for one reason or the next. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I understand people's frustration for soft. And I totally can like accept that, especially like in the US, like the, the idea is sometimes people condescend others because they're like, just vote. Why wouldn't you vote? And like to me, of course, I, it takes me less than five minutes to do that in Canada. In the US, I'm seeing people like some time line six to nine hours like that is a work day. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Make that a national holiday. I know it's a totally separate issue, but I totally understand why Should people le yeah, disenfranchised with that very access. It's like that. I, I just I literally can't. I can't take that much time I'm off work to go do that or something like that. So in that respect, like I understand people's frustration and also to your point point that yes it does seem that a lot of times both parties aren't representational of the people especially not from a leftist perspective like they're both uh at the end of the day furthering policies that benefit the very rich there's there's no question no matter how you you separate the two and the idea of harm mitigation because that's what it is it's harm mitigation if you are simply trying to avoid a full-blown like you know barreling towards fascists like Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump or something like that or ne neoliberal who furthers and expands poverty or in cars in carceral space or, or problems like that so it's so I understand the frustration. Deciding that you are personally not going to vote and having legitimate reasons for your personal disenchantment is a different thing from taking an anti-voting position, encouraging others not to vote, and worse, presenting your personal decision not to vote as the one right thing to do or something that is going to move us closer towards any shared goal. And to those making the general argument that voting legitimizes the state, let me address that. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make sense at all and i read someone one of these reddit threads is talking about well, when you're voting you're basically acquiescing to the state continuing to exist in this heterosexist you know capitalistic society i'm like but like half 40 percent what's the percentage of people who vote less than half so right. didn't if voting meant that you were somehow propping up the state then the, few, the the number of people who vote now should mean that the state would be steadily d dissolving in some way or devolving but it's yeah. not it's getting more powerful and he, 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 i tell you no one can get it I just, I, it's frustrating and i read these reddit threads and i can tell that some of the people who are writing read like white people right and so i automatically discount that because if you are a white person in this country and you're running around talking about i'm an anarchist viva la revolution i'm sorry f you there's nothing about the revolution that is really going to harm you meanwhile people that look like me people who are trans no, it's not it they will deaths deaths people will die there's literally yes. an ongoing effort there's an ongoing anti-trans genocide like it's a genocide people think oh it's like just kind of cutesy you know everyone's calling everyone groomers and blah blah no they want people to not be trans when you are trying to erase people from the thing that they are that's genocide so I don't understand how you can look at this election and look at what's going on with these this wave of anti-trans bills that have been pouring out of state legislatures and say, eh, I'm not going to vote because it doesn't matter. Literally, do you have a trans friend? Look your trans friend in the eye and say it doesn't matter if I if I vote or not. Now, if you live in a state, if we're talking only national elections, right? Yes. And if you live in a state that's like reliably blue or if you, then fine. You know, maybe vote because you're, you're trying to vote for a third party. Maybe it'll help them, you know, maybe it'll uh, raise interest in that party. They'll be able to raise money. Like, I get that. But, it, but if you're living in New York or you're living in California and you're telling people in Ohio and Florida, and Wisconsin and Michigan that it doesn't matter that they vote, what the f are you smoking? Like, I truly, <laughs> I, can't, I can't figure it out. And what bothers me the most is that when I talk to the people who have these viewpoints, they talk to me like I'm an asshole. Yes, right. They talk right. to you like you're the one. You're the shit lib that doesn't give a. Yeah. What I'm like, I'm a shit lib. I've been yeah. called a shit lib for so many years, and it's like, I've been doing abortion rights. I've been extremely online doing abortion rights for 11 years. 11 years, and all the same kinds of people calling me a shit lib now were the same kinds of people patting me on the head and saying, "Oh, Roe is fine." Like I remember that. Fear mongering about Roe. Stop fear mongering about the Supreme Court. And now I'm like, do you see what happened? 
So, but then when I bring that up, when I bring abortion rights up, well, you know, we lost abortion rights under uh, under a, a Democrat. Where is Biden? How come b- the Democrats didn't pass you know, codify Roe when they had supermajorities in the Senate? Well, number one, how many times did they have supermajorities in the Senate? And number two, did you care enough about abortion rights to push them to do shit? And exactly. The to that question is absolutely not. No, you didn't. You're using abortion rights. You're using my main issue to attack me because I think it's important to still continue to vote and do other things. Right. It's vote and not vote. Go to sleep. Vote. Take a nap. It's vote and continue to do the mutual, the mutual, mutual aid, the mutual aid, the the on the ground organizing, the canvassing, the, you know, the stop the cop city actions. Like there's so many things that are going on that people are doing. And I respect that. But if you're doing those things, but then at the same time refusing to do the one thing that might actually benefit some people or at least block the harm that is hurling their way. I don't know what to say to those people. And even still, my problem with the anti-voting message is very specific to when it's geared at the black community. Disenchanting black voters for so many reasons, or the fact that it's always white people in my audience screaming at me to adopt this message to my black audience. Voting is is extremely important. And then it has been, especially in the black community for a long time. And whether people want to realize or recognize this uh, or or not, it's just, it's helped us along the way throughout the past several decades. I have a white audience, right? Like I be trying to explain this to to people in my life, the difference between, I'm like, you can have thousands of black people that follow you and are in your audience, but that doesn't make your audience a black audience. There's a difference. You know what's happening. I have a white audience and I am hyper aware of it, Dr. Stevens. And, and, and I take big issue. I'm an immigrant. I can't even vote, which also to me lands, lands a perspective. It's like, I've been living in America now since I was 14. I'm 30 now. And I'm a lawyer. I work in the courts. I work in the system. So I know deeply what it means to not be able to vote and recognizing how relevant it is and to be politically involved and engaged. So it's extra sick to me to have this white audience wanting me to push an anti-voting message and telling me it doesn't matter. And and then I'm like, I feel like I have to unpack that on so many levels because on one level, when they say it doesn't matter, it confuses me to hear a white person say their vote doesn't matter when you get what you want. You know what I'm saying? Like you are living... You get what you want. Like, we can't even have, to me, me and a white person, a black person and a white person should not be in conversation together when it comes to the my vote doesn't matter conversation. Because those, even even in theory, those are different worlds. Because you can understand a theoretical conversation from a black person on why my vote doesn't matter. Looking out at the state of the country, the things that we've asked for, the issues that we've been plagued for by generation by generation. You can understand intellectually why a black person might say my vote doesn't matter but a white person saying my vote doesn't matter is a different right. what are you what you're not getting and i'm not saying that there aren't individual white people not getting what they want out of voting or from the government no in actuality white people and everybody everybody is being f- in this capitalist white supremacist system we live in, especially working class white people. And the white leftists definitely want a different world than the ones their mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, neighbors, and significant others keep voting for, sure. But that's, that's the point, isn't it? They get what they want as a collective. You know, from the black perspective, what, what, what actually have we gotten? You know, civil rights, 64 civil rights, uh, 65 voting rights. We we got those two respectively. Since then, what has voting netted us? We've put Bill Clinton into the White House. We got the 94 crime bill. We put so when black folks say we're we're saying it based on a long track record of. I mean, we got free from slavery, but we got free from Jim Crow a little bit, but that's it. Um, white folks, when they say that, I, I look at it through the lens of, but y'all got a lot ready. Like, I'm not <laughs> saying there's no poor white people. Clear, clearly, there's a white working class, and they deserve more, just like the rest of us deserve more. But they they do get... What, one of those groups of white folks get stuff. <laughs> yeah. you know, progressive white folks ain't getting nothing. I feel y'all. Solidarity. Workers of the world unite. But the, y'all cousins are getting exactly what they want every election cycle. So, you know, when we say voting doesn't matter, I look at it from a material perspective. Who's getting what? Black folks, we always get the short end of the stick. Um, but that doesn't mean we stop fighting. White men and white women vote Republican. 
And even when they're voting Democrat, it's rarely for the Democrat they think will bring them change and usually the one who dresses up the status quo the best. You get what you want as a collective. So please, I mean this kindly, shut the f up and stop talking to the rest of us like we are in the same boat. We are not. And as a black woman, let me just, may, may I say that, as a, as a black woman from a distance, black folks better get out there to vote. If don't nobody else vote because of what it took to get us to vote. Now I'm not saying just throw your vote anywhere because I'm not for that either. I am not for that. We need to be conscious minded voters. And if people are not answering to our demands as black people, let me just, I'm gonna put everybody else in the parking lot for, for a minute. I'm gonna come back and get them though. I'm talking to black people right now. Let me explain something to everybody listening. There is absolutely nothing the government spends hundreds of years actively trying to stop you from doing if doing it didn't matter. Let me explain something to everybody listening. There is absolutely nothing the government spends hundreds of years actively trying to stop you from doing if doing it didn't matter. When you see the painstaking efforts these people go through to make sure that black votes don't count, right? Exactly. The most nefarious one I'm seeing right now is being spread through um, Instagram influencers and it's telling young black people to expect to get paid. Uh, I heard young, young black men say, I'm not voting unless they pay me to vote. And, and, and they argued it with a level of intensity as though they have been spending a lot of time on social media arguing this. And, and my thing is this, like, when you sit down and pause and think about where that talking point came from, how it got laundered through black influencers on Instagram, and now it is so pervasive that it's saturated down to some of our youth, you really have to pause and say, okay, who has that kind of power to spread that kind of misinformation with the express purposes of neutralizing our vote. You know, yes. that doesn't just happen. That's a concentrated effort of propaganda, money, and campaigning, and influencing black influencers. Yeah, on Instagram. yeah. So they are, they are most certainly committed to making sure black folks don't vote. <laughs> but, you know, I get frustrated when I see a lot of these black operatives who use these na the narration like stuff hasn't changed for black people? I'm like, well, which black people are you talking about? Because stuff, Ice Cube, stuff changes for you because based on the tax law, your life looks different, and so you have different motivations to tell people to stop voting for this party, right? Because there are certain material conditions that shift for you, which make you go in a particular way. Let's do some math. Congress passed the Fifteenth Amendment in 1870 granting black men the right to vote specifically because black men had been being turned away from polling stations systematically despite having been granted citizenship by the Fourth Amendment two years prior. The story of black Americans begins with voter suppression. That was 153 years ago. Following the passing of the 15th Amendment, did they let black men vote peacefully? No. Most of us know our country fought a civil war in the 1860s, but less is known about what came afterward, the chaotic, exhilarating, and ultimately devastating period known as Reconstruction. It was a moment of profound change with promises of citizenship and equal rights for all. One of the greatest achievements of Reconstruction was granting black men the right to vote. In 1867 alone, over 80% of all the black men in the former Confederate states registered to vote. Three years later, Hiram Revels was elected the first black man to serve in the United States Senate. And Joseph Rainey became the first black United States congressman. Their election paved the way for more than 2,000 black office holders who served at every level of government during Reconstruction. There are not many moments in recorded human history where a group that was so subordinated would, within the space of a decade, actually be integrated into the highest echelons of political society. But the momentum wouldn't last. Black men's access to the ballot box, along with other key rights gained during Reconstruction, were rolled back systematically throughout the South. In 1875, near the end of Reconstruction, the 44th Congress included seven black House members and a United States Senator. By 1900, only one remained. 
Congressman George Henry White of North Carolina. By the time George H. White leaves office in 1901, he literally turns the light off on national black political leadership. No one will come behind him for an entire generation. One of the cruel ironies of Reconstruction is that black people could claim certain rights in the 1870s that they would have to fight to reclaim in the 1960s. A sobering reminder that achievements thought permanent can be overturned and rights can never be taken for granted. The suppression of the black vote continues today in so many forms, like gerrymandering, voter ID laws, and it's not just black people they come for like this, by the way. The Idaho GOP just passed the law banning student IDs as voter IDs in order to go after young folks because they want to thwart the young progressive voter turnout they saw last election from Gen Z. And the big one, felon disenfranchisement, which is one of the big reasons for the intentional mass incarceration of black people in America. About 2.3%, a total of 5.3 million people of the American voting age population is disenfranchised because of these felony voter restriction laws that prevent people from voting if convicted of a crime. And over one third of these disenfranchised individuals are black. And that's why it's different when a black person feels disenchanted with voting or feels that their vote doesn't matter. I might not agree because I think that the myriad of ways that the state goes out of its way to suppress the black vote, to disenfranchise and disenchant the black voter is actually proof of how much our vote does matter and how much they fear the power of that vote. But I understand completely why voting rings hollow to a lot of black folk experiencing that. We give almost 100% of our vote to the Democratic Party, and the question has to be asked, what have you done for me lately? To quote Sister Janet Jackson, is it working for our people? Now, I get, and I know we're going to get into neo-fascism, and, and, ne and neo-fascism is an immediate threat. And the Republicans today, especially on the federal and state level, have proven themselves to be neo-fascist, no doubt about it. Neo-fascism kills you quick but neoliberalism kills you slowly. And I had a mentor who used, who used to say, it doesn't matter whether or not you meant to kill me on accident or, or, or on purpose, dead is dead. That's the thing I've been thinking about, right? Because on one hand, I, I believe, I feel all the frustrations that people feel with the Democrats. I feel frustrated with the concept of the fact that Democrats expect black people to go out and always be their strongest voter base to mobilize the most of that black women, mobilize the most votes for them and do all of this. And yet we are once they're in office after it's the, you know, the one article like, oh, thank black women. Then after that, it, it is no need to, to tend to our needs. And so I do feel frustrated with this concept of they don't have to, it feels like they don't have to earn our vote because we don't have any other choice. And, but to that point, it doesn't feel like we have any other choice, if I'm honest, because as much as I feel the frustrate the frustration with, with the Democrats not doing more, right, not being enough against the status quo, the Republicans do strike me in my heart of hearts, no matter how much I've tried to assess this and I've tried to see that they're the same thing um, for weeks now. I just can't seem to. Uh, I, I do see them as this is a fascist threat so then i think what are what are our options what is the most tactical thing we do is is it to that people should vote third party i don't know and that's what i've been trying to get to the source of so what do you think you know i'm i'm right where you are Olay, and probably where most people are and the frustration is real i'm not going to dismiss people's frustration just because i am you know uh what i would call myself a justice type democrat i i get it I, I still believe that's what the system wants to do. It wants to grind everyday people to a halt so that you just continuously accept the lesser of the two evils. There's gonna, And I was having this fascinating, deep conversation with a dear girlfriend of mine who just echoed everything that you just did, Olay. Like, what choice do I have? She asked. I frustrated with the Democrats. Hell to the no, will I vote for a Republican, especially the ones on the federal, and I keep emphasizing federal and state level in particular, you know, what other choice do I have? And I answered her this way. From a tactical perspective, we get it. But there's always a choice. And at some point, Black people especially, because we give almost 100% of our vote. See, our other sisters and brothers and family friends, they'll tip out every now and then. They'll go to the other side. They let folks know they're not playing with them, but not us. We save the Democrats each and every time. 
And what really materially I'm asking, systemically I'm asking, do we have to show for it? At some point, black people are going to have to make a collective decision on a set of issues, you know, because we might not always agree. Some Democrats are rocking with neoliberals. Some Democrats are Bernie-crats, as you know. Hell, some Democrats, some some uh, black people, excuse me, you know, uh, vote for Trump. I mean, as, as curious as I know that makes some people feel, that is a very real reality. Some d- uh, black people, you know, rock with the Clinton. I get it. But at some point, our blackness has to override any and all candidates that we may feel a fondness or, or a closeness to. And let me not leave out President Obama. There are Obama, Obamaites too, all of them out there, Every whatever, how you rock. But as black people, at some point, we got to agree on like a top three or something where that no candidate, no party can shake us from it. Now, when I bring in everybody else, and when I mean everybody else, I mean everybody else that is a working class person. So black working class, white working class, Hispanic working class, Asian working class, uh, Muslim or Arab, excuse me, working class, and everybody else in between. At some point, there's going to have to be a true working class solidarity in the way we vote too. And I think the push by labor unions is one of the greatest and best for this moment. Ole, tactical models we have. And I am saying that because... The House of Labor rocking all kinds of ways when it comes to voting. You got Republicans and you got Democrats and and however those people fall on the spectrum. But one thing they do know is that they got to fight the man or the woman who has their feet on their neck when it comes to bargaining for better wages and work conditions and benefits. And they coalesce together and they put all that other stuff aside. We are going to have to do the same thing both as black people and as a working class people. And one more thing on this point, I do not believe that we can deal with class without dealing with caste. They both go hand in hand. In other words, let me break this down for folks who want to understand what I'm saying, that we cannot deal with the grievances, the very real grievances of working class people from all walks of life and leave race on the side, leave anti-blackness on the side, because I guarantee you that every single issue animating the needs of working class started with anti-black, hear me clearly, anti-black racism in the United States of America. Because where you see a racist, you see a sexist. You know, you see somebody that's homophobic. All of those things go together. And we cannot deny as a movement of people that anti-blackness and, 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 and liberation from it will shake asunder this country as it has done historically time and time again. When black folks are liberated, everybody liberated. Experienced everything because when you even taking it back to to, to the voting doesn't matter or that comment on my vote doesn't matter. It's like when a black person says that it's because I feel like I get nothing out of voting. And when a white person says that it's because I feel like I'm supposed to get everything out of voting. And those are two different things. I'm like, black people feeling like, oh, I, I, you were supposed to at least do the bare minimum for me and you are not providing that for me. The bare minimum protections. I'm still being killed by police. My, my communities are still being over-policed. I'm still being subjected to violence. I'm still being impoverished. You know, bare minimum, bare minimum, bare minimum. And I feel like you won't even, you won't even rise to that. Whereas when you hear the white people, it's, it's that I haven't gotten everything it's supposed to be. That should be the end of my involvement. I should, I should, I should get everything that I want out of the politicians because the, it is their job to give me everything. And that comes from a place of privilege and what it means to occupy the space of whiteness in America. And that's the short on why targeting black people in specific with anti-voting messaging pisses me off. Moving on. If you are not familiar with the accelerationist argument because you talk to reasonable people, let me fill you in. There are people who believe that we should let the country plummet into fascism, let matters get worse, let whatever happens happens, let the Republicans win because people will then be forced to burn it all down, viva la revolution. My law school ex-boyfriend actually believed this silly shit. I remember like it was yesterday. Picture it. 
is early 2016 and he was insisting that we need to let Trump win because that's what America could quote deserves and people will blah, 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 blah. And I remember his daddy looking at him and saying, so basically you want to strap the country to the rails while the train comes? That's what you want to do? That's what you want to do? That's what you want to do? Okay, all right. And that dummy did want that. And that's what we got. And did the revolution happen? Did the revolution happen or did an insurrection? Did the Democrats become the radical leftists you always dreamed or did they move further to the right as the obvious result of allowing a far right party to take over and gain more and more power and influence? I have nobody in this video speaking to accelerationism because it's not a perspective I respect. If you tell me in 2023 that you are okay with, like, or are unafraid of a reality where this country plummets into fascism, you are not only announcing to me that you exist in so severe a state of privilege that you will be unaffected by the consequences of a mother authoritarian regime where Republicans are trying to wipe marginalized groups off the map, but you have the unmitigated arrogance to try to repackage that privilege as some kind of noble principled revolutionary position and I will not humor that. And it's not because I'm some voice of the working class that I say that. No, 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 precisely the opposite. I'm a privileged bitch in many respects too. Not so many that a Trump or DeSantis administration wouldn't bring me to my knees because trust, as someone at the mercy of USCIS, that it would, but I know just how privileged I am and just how much more privileged and insulated from the consequences of the shit the talking heads feeding you this accelerationist bullshit are. And that's a problem for me. And I can sit here and say, you know, I'm a pretty privileged person. Yeah, I'm black and I, and I have all, all of the baggage that comes with being black in America. But I, you know, I could survive another Trump presidency. I could. Same. And there are a lot of people, quite frankly, who are encouraging other people to vote who would thrive under another Trump presidency, right? Like their Patreon subscriptions will go up. They'll get more appearances on Rumble or High Rising or whatever. And it's like, I wonder how many of these people actually believe what they're saying or if it's just like a money making operation, right? Like. Grievance sells, like outrage sells. And if you can spend four years being really, really angry at Trump, then you can, you know, you can get all the people, embrace all the people who are also really, really angry at Trump. But what does that do? We had four years of Trump and nothing got burnt down except black communities. Right. Nothing got burnt down but trans rights. Where are all these white revolutionaries? Why aren't they in the streets? Why? The Republicans, they're very clearly, you know, pushing a transgender uh, attack and leading to an ongoing transgender genocide that's happening in this country. Like, you know, more anti-trans bills have been introduced in the past, you know, two years than the entire preceding, you know, history of this country. Let me ask you something right quick. Let me ask you all something. Do you think that these political commentators, journalists, and YouTube who all, who all, including the right-wing ones who constantly shit on Democrats living in their big liberal cities, conveniently all live in those big liberal cities with Democrat administrations making way more bread than you, not experiencing any of the shit they make themselves the face of. Do you think those people are gonna be the ones who can't access healthcare, gender affirming care, education, housing, and everything else? No, they're not. We're not, I'm not. And I need that privilege to be front and center in your minds when you hear them trying to tell you it doesn't make a difference whether the Dems or the Republicans are in office, that they're not scared of Trump, all while talking this accelerationist shit. Moreover, it's hard for me to understand how such a position could even be based in good faith when it's as blatantly nonsensical as it is arrogant. Because again, we are living the proof that accelerationism does not work. I was, I was be on that shit, dog. I don't care if I used to be on that shit. I, I, uh, 2016, is one of them places and things I can be real, real and real, uh, I feel like transparent about. I was a real radical for, for like, I ain't vote for Obama. I'm like, yeah. I ain't voting. I ain't vote for Hillary Clinton. She probably gonna get it anyway, but I ain't voting. I don't think nothing matter. I was in grad school when, 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 when Hillary Clinton took the L. The next day I went to class, I had like three or four immigrant uh, buddies that I really rock with. They come to school, they shit. One of them a dude, he, he's distraught. Feel me? He don't know. I, he usually all chipper and shit. He distraught. The other two, you know what I'm saying? Two, two women. They crying. One of them been saving her money to go back home for for Christmas for two, two or three summers. She now she don't even know. She already bought a ticket too. She already paid the bread, but she already recognized like she, the, the Muslim ban that already went down and this, that, and the other. So if I go, I can't do this. I seen how much it impacted this presidential election. Impacted so much shit, and I feel like, hey, if you really say you about what you're being about, you 
have been selfish for specifically two elections that's had a big implication, had a big material impact on how they live their lives. So yeah. you thought it would be cool without you was on some pro-black shit to be like, nah, rock this and just be real. I, 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 even, I even thought about it, like, realistically, I'm in Oklahoma. You feel me? Um, Oklahoma was, was, was going to go red anyway. But I don't think that it's enough for me to ethically be like, well, it's like, nah, ain't good enough. So it's like, be that, that, that made, because usually I'm a person like, I forget presidential elections, all about local elections, blah, blah, blah. Now, hey, listen, I was in office when they overturned three, four, five shit, shit we seen. I didn't matter. You made a video about overturning this and overturning this and overturning that. That came from one president having a little bit too much power to be able to get some Congress people in them up. So it's like, listen, man, in, in four years, he appointed more Congress people than these motherfuckers did in eight, 16 years. Obama yep. did eight, but Bush did eight. They only get, what, three people out that they appointed? Three? Yep, yep. Motherfucker yep. appointed four. So shit like that. Yes, yes. You know, I've gone through, I covered 2016, I covered 2020, I'm gonna cover 2024. What I, one of the big arguments, that were absolutely dispelled after 2016 is the idea that, oh, if if Hillary loses in 2016, well, the Democratic Party will learn its lesson and then they will speak to the issues of the left and they will speak to real working class issues. That didn't happen because the Democratic Party does not care. The Democratic Party, as it currently sits, is a capitalist organization. They care about what the leadership cares about. So there is no teaching the party a lesson. They, they will simply turn around, and even if it isn't the left's fault, they will blame the left for losing, and they won't do anything to actually try to appeal to them. So that, you know, that point often makes people think, well, then why would I vote for them? Because they hate me. But it's because voting is a tool. Voting isn't voting for you know, all your hopes and dreams, and there is no perfect candidate. But back to the break, the corporate duopoly argument I keep seeing over and over again online, but never in real life. What the f you want to break the corporate duopoly? Even if it means Republicans win, we broke the duopoly. What the f you think that's what regular people vote? I mean, they don't even know what the f that means. The average <laughs> voter wouldn't even know what that means. What the f you mean corporate duopoly? <laughs> like, Which of these n gonna cut my services? Tough. Which of these n gonna gonna cut police funding? Which of these is gonna um illegalize trans my my gender identity? You know what I'm saying? Like it's. I'm not worried about none of that shit. Listen, in Atlanta, I am scared. I'm low key scared of the police out here right now. I yeah, cop city. Scared yeah. That it used to be because I because I had some I heard some things. So we gonna see. But generally speaking, I'm not scared of the police like my former students are. Yeah. Like my cousins have been in Chicago. I'm not scared of street crime like my former students are. Like some of my homies in other parts of the city or in Chicago. Um, I'm not scared of being made it, it, it may, being coming illegal to be straight. You know what I'm saying? I'm not scared of most of the things that are tangibly affected. I don't have a uterus. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not worried about those things. And so, voting is not going to start the revolution. It's not going to enact the the policy changes that I want to see in the, all by itself. But it, it, it is going to clean some germs off my hands after I take a shit. I, I don't know how that's going to play, but like I want you to put that in. <laughs> and I will. And I will. Effie, and I will do that for like, you. And that's how I feel about people that don't vote. I'll be like, oh, you don't wash your hands? <laughs> Look me in my eye. Look me in my eye. You cannot tell me your goal is to break the corporate duopoly by having one of the two parties in the duopoly win. That's not breaking the f***ing duopoly. That's literally how it functions. That's how the two-party system works. Getting Republicans in office does not break the f***ing corporate duopoly. It gets us a Republican administration. That is it, and that is all. If you imagine only real choices are only Republicans and Democrats, I don't know who the f*** you think you're showing who's boss by selecting one of those choices. And the f***ing worst one at that. And the f***ing worst one at that. And if you think Democrats are worse than Republicans, your marbles have just obviously left the chat. And so should you, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> you can wanna break the corporate duopoly, sure. That's valid, that's fair, that's whatever. But I can't engage this continued posturing that it's the average American voter's agenda by people whose clear and transparent goals are to support the Republican party or iron out some personal grievance with the Democrats. Enough, enough.
When I say that the average voter doesn't know what the f you're talking about when you say break the corporate duopoly, I'm not just saying that because a voter might not be familiar with the particular terminology that it means they don't care about something. But what I'm saying is that simply does not get to the heart of what voters need or care about. I always feel like we need to address people's fundamental needs first. Food, clothing, and shelter. We need jobs. We need living wage jobs immediately. Yeah. Under Trump, things were bad. Under Biden, they're a little bit better, but they're still not where they need to be. I think that's what people are thinking about right now. How can I eat? How can I survive? How can I pay my bills? People want to live lives of dignity and safety. I think our education system has to get better. I don't know if that's at the top of people's list. Because again, I can't talk about even like what's in the curriculum if I haven't eaten yet. Yeah. As they watch the attack on critical race theory, history, books, gender, race, you know, checking out, the they're literally trying to control, they're trying to cage our minds. We have to resist that. We don't just need to go back to the days of Biden or keep the days of Biden or Obama. We need to go beyond that. We need to normalize a kind of abolitionist future. Um, yeah. And while the average person in the hood may not be using the language of abolition, they know that they wish, you know, their family members weren't sitting in, 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 in jail. Yeah. You know, with a with million dollars on their head or, or, or $500,000 bail on the head that they can't afford to get out even with bond. They, they know they don't want to, they know they're afraid of police, you know. Um, now, they're also afraid of right? Like, I mean, keeping it 100, right? Like, they're also afraid that when they walk down the street, they're going to get robbed. They're also yeah. afraid. So, so, so how do we address that? By addressing poverty, by addressing unemployment, by addressing education, by, by, by getting at the things that produce criminality. If you're someone who really follows me and watches my stuff throughout the years, you probably already know that I have a pension for reminding everyone that Audre Lorde said, there are no new pains, just new ways to make things felt. And that's something I remind myself of often, that everything we're experiencing today, the generations before us were too. Everything we battled, they battled too. Which means every position in today's war was available in yesterday's war. So please understand that the position you play today is the position you would have played. The same roles are available. So babe, if today your only contribution to the movement is tweeting angrily at me that we need to burn it all down, not vote, you are in fact not a burning it all down. Just like you would not have been in yesterday's war. You are doing what you would be doing in the movement. Please understand that the burn it all down got it cracking for real. The light the cups up really do that. So if that's not what you're doing, that is not what you do. And that is okay. That is okay. Please divorce yourself from this idea that you need to liken yourself to revolutionaries or postures, anything other than people who care who are doing their best and who are trying to do their best with what they're capable of and the tools that they have. You do not need to cosplay like revolutionaries. You don't need to posture. You don't need to perpetuate like you the getting it out the mud. Like Marcus Garvey, like you, I am not the bitch burning it all down. And that's not a slight to Garvey, me or you. But like Garvey, if you believe that the one true path to freedom is a path you yourself are not able to pursue, you must obviously use as many other tools as possible at your disposal with the knowledge that none of them individually can bring about your liberation, but that they can collectively move you closer. But more important than the fact that none of these tools by themselves can bring about your liberation is remembering that no government administration ever will. To be frankly, you know, this, this term that they're coming up with and trying to use some connotated meanings that we use in black America, to say uh, woke is something negative, but guess what? I'd rather be woke than sleep. I talked to everybody and their mama to find out how they felt about voting, how something that seemed so innocuous to me, like if you can vote, you should, became controversial. Like why so much ire, or at least what's the disconnect? Why don't I feel the same ire? I figured out why I agree with folk that the Democrats don't do what we want them to do, and that pisses me the f off. Yet, I still don't feel disappointed shocked or that people shouldn't vote or shouldn't vote for them. The three reason a lot of people feel disenchanted with the idea of voting is because one, they feel like they're being sold the idea that if they vote, something will change and nothing does. Two, they think the government is supposed to bring about radical change. And last, but certainly not least, 
They think who they vote for is supposed to reflect them, say something about them, that it's representative of who they are and everything they believe. But that is not what I am selling, nor what I think anybody should be selling about voting. The government, any government, meaning any political administration, is an operational force maintaining the status quo or the society as it knows it. The people's desire is to change the status quo. If the people's desire is to change the status quo, that operational force will act as a blockade from that change. They are a force that will fight against the people. That's the point. That operational force is never there to help bring about the change the people are trying to see. That's why we call our efforts as a people a resistance. We are resisting the force that is the government. So for me, the frustration with voting comes from the expectation that the administration is going to upheave or radically change the system that empowers it. And that doesn't make sense. It's the antithesis of what the government is there to do. The government doesn't create change, the people do. I get the frustration that people are having because they're, as you laid out, material needs are not being met by either party. And I surmise that neither major party is answering to the needs of the people. So folks might say, well, Senator Turner, are you still a Democrat? Yes, I am. I am still a Democrat because I'm still fighting, you know, because we only have two major parties right now. And you got to be able to leverage. It's tactical more than anything. I want people to understand that. Yes, to answer your question directly, while I went all around the block, Voting is still a relevant tool, but notice how I said it is one of many tools. It is not the only tool. It will not come and save us immediately. There are other things that we, conscious-minded people, should be doing in and around and before elections because election is the last, it's the last leg. Of, of, the, of the race. It's not the first leg. We got to be out there agitating. We got to agitate, aggravate, push for the things that we want to see elected officials do. We have to organize, you know, Michael Render, AKA Killer Mike, a dear friend of mine. He has a saying that I think fits for anybody that's in organizing and it's plan, plot, organize, strategize, and mobilize. That is what we must be doing at all times. Voting in and of itself is not going to be the thing that gets us there. We got to do the other things in and around it. And we have to be engaged as a community beyond just federal politics, who's in the state houses and governor's mansions matter, who's on the regional level or what we would call the county level of government matters, who's on school boards matter, and who serves on the, on the local levels of government matter. So when people say the off-year election, as far as I'm concerned, there is no year that's off because every single year, no matter where you live, there are either issues on the ballot or there's somebody on the ballot who sits in the judiciary matters too. So we got to be on and popping on. Like Every administration is going to be the adversary of the people, the oppositional force we have to try to move or fight through. So you vote for the outcome easiest for you to fight. And as someone on the left, I can fight the Democrats, but I, we have absolutely no ability to fight or push the Republicans. Republicans don't care if we oppose their agenda or don't approve of what they're doing. <laughs> they do care actually because they love it when we oppose what they're doing. You cannot pressure a, it, someone as someone who's an activist on the left, you cannot pressure somebody who is a Republican. So, you know, that's, and that goes to all the potential energy wasted during the four years of Trump. Like all the potential pressure that could have been on Hillary for other things were spent on hoping Trump doesn't steal the next election. Like it was just, yeah. the focus is completely off of anything material because you can't expect a Republican president and the party controlling Congress to do anything for your life. So it's all about, you know, trying to uh, prevent just how bad what they're going to do is, which you can argue in some ways is also when Democrats are in power too, but it's still, it's, it's to much different degrees. And people also, I think get, get caught up in this idea that, oh, if I vote for this person, then, then I can't complain, which is, I, I don't know who thought this idea up, but that's ridiculous. Like, yeah, no, just because it's you, voted for, say, uh, Kathy Hochul or uh, Hochul, whatever her name is, it, just because you voted for her doesn't mean you now have to support everything she does. No, you you get to criticize, you get to push, you get to pressure in however way, whoever's in power, whoever you right. want, because, but the difference being with the Democrat in power, there is more of a, a potential there to actually have some impact because it is a Democratic uh, politician and they, 
they have to worry about losing some votes from some people. So they yeah. have to speak to some of those issues, some of those groups that otherwise a Republican would not be caring about at all. It's so the, the thing that I'm sure you're going to get in this video is that we are working against our own best interests by keeping them in power. And to me, that fundamentally misunderstands the nature of power. Yeah. We are not keeping them in power, right? We are the only check on the power they actually get from all these other institutions, systems uh, that we suffer under. So we don't keep them, like they're going to be there regardless, or somebody worse is going to be there that we can't check at all. Although this election is probably a little bit different because I think this is going to come down to Trump versus Biden probably. And if that's the case, I think that a lot of voters, particularly liberals and lefties are going to see that this is more about democracy than anything else. Like this is kind of make or break. Like to me, I'm not gonna vote for Joe Biden because I think that he is going to uh, do anything about my student loan debt or expand healthcare at all. I'm voting for him because he's not Donald Trump. and. I think that that really matters, even if I know that he's not going to like benefit me in any way, shape or form, politically speaking. And I know that I can't really push him left. I'm voting for him because he's not Trump. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So I feel like I have the best take on this. <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody's going to be better than what I'm about to give you right here. Right. Vote like you wash your hands. The same energy that you, when you take a shit. <laughs> or you or you or you play you outside or you you've been doing something right you wash your hands you don't wash your hands because you like to you don't wash your hands to keep you from getting shot or keep you from getting cancer or anything like that you wash your hands because it's a basic minimal thing you can do to lower the risk of catching some bullshit yes yeah and, and like the thing the thing that i think people struggle with is they want we've been taught voting is like this bigger more profound thing that yeah. we are we are who we vote for we identify with the party we represent we wear the colors we fly the flags and shit and like i get it i was there in like 2008 fd had had the hope shirt had the big <laughs> o was playing will i am you know what i'm saying <laughs> i was in there and then 2012 fd was like ah it don't make it don't make that much difference. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, especially so, like if I if I didn't live in Georgia, yeah, I might vote for uh, Conor West. I might vote for insert random here that's not doesn't have a real chance as a as a personal statement or as a, as a branding strategy or some shit. Yeah, I live I live in a low key swing state. Yeah, so I'm gonna vote for I'm gonna vote for Joe Biden. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. You know why? Because I took a shit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it, it, <laughs> it don't really mean, it don't got to mean so much like folks. And it's, and it's really, it's really a bigger thing on how um, cooked leftist politics are from a prag, from, from a praxis pragmatic standpoint. Yeah. That we can have, like this video might do numbers. You know yeah. why? Because motherfuckers, woo, they love you know, posturing about their leftist identity yeah. um, through meaningless, um, through meaningless like shows of protest and whatever. Because voting is a tool. Voting isn't voting for, you know, all your hopes and dreams. And there is no perfect candidate. You're always going to compromise no matter who the candidate is. There is no perfect person for you unless you're voting for yourself. <laughs> you know, there is no perfect candidate for your for for you. So because of that, because of the fact that there's always a compromise. You're always voting based on what the context of the situation is. So when it comes to a voting for a president, I think in most cases, at least in modern time, you're voting essentially against the other side. You're in, in the case, you know, against uh, Trump or any other uh, Republican, you're voting against fascism. And the real focus you have to make is on the down ballot races. So, you know, because there will be some better choices down the ballot where there are going to be candidates that maybe appeal to you a little more uh, that do speak to your issues. But just because every single candidate on that ballot isn't, you know, you doesn't mean you shouldn't vote. It means you have to change how uh, how you think about voting, depending on the context of what you're voting in. And which is why I think voting it, it's it's like there's so many layers to this, because it's important to also point out that, you know, voting isn't everything. It, 
there is, in terms of actual changes in society, I think the most important thing is the power of people. So we're talking about, you know, unions, activists. I think that's where a lot of the real change happens is from the ground up. Voting is simply one of the ways that the masses can interact with society. It should be a tool in the tool set. It should be one of the things that you focus on at one point in the year. Like the problem with the US too, is it's in a perpetual election cycle, like in both in the media and just the way that y'all treat it, right? It's always talking about elections, getting ready, who's the next uh, you know, warrior who's gonna go up against the standard, this kind of stuff, right? Where at the end of the day, like, if you are concerned about making, I'd say, material change for people's lives, that has to be one part of it. That's one element of it that has to be like, again, there's not going to be a light switch. There's not there's not going to be a flip. And you'll always be disappointed in this process if you feel that way, because like that's why I think some people online are obsessed with AOC to an almost like weird perverted level. But it's just like it's everything she says and everything she does and whether it's the worst thing in the world or the best thing in the world or this or that. It's like this. This is one one. It's one politician who has a megaphone and should use it. And don't get me wrong, please push your politicians to be better all the time, right? Yeah. Call them out, sure. But she cannot turn on socialism, right? Her alone, yeah. right? Why hyper focus on this one individual? Whereas you should be focusing on so many more things down the road. Like, please go do direct action, go join an organization, yeah. go volunteer for Food Not Bombs, or, or join like an LGBTQ plus org in your area because you'll find, like, at the end of the day, you'll feel so much better about a lot of this shit. As well. Peep game. I'm an educator. I come from an education background. Uh, the school funding, it's all predicated off of taxes of where you at, property taxes. We know that, right? We also know, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, like, like if, if you believe your kids should receive a high quality education in the classroom, you worried about funding, you worried about how teachers being taken care of, or the curriculum, who's the superintendent. All these things, all these things controlled by voting. At the same time, though. Well, look, uh, it's I'm not saying that elections no. don't matter, that that voting is irrelevant or all of that. But the, and there are many other criteria. You know, the, the, there's the, the growing climate emergency. There's foreign policy issues. There's there's broader kinds of economic justice issues. And so people need to consider a full range of things. You know, we don't typically vote for someone based on just one single issue litmus test. Yeah. You know, I spend my time on get out the vote efforts, endlessly messaging about how bad DeSantis or Trump are, or do I spend my limited political capital trying to build up organizations and communities that are fighting very local battles in very concrete ways that are changing people's minds about what is possible, what it might look like. Um, and so my feeling is in this moment, that's that's really where I put my energy. Yeah. Sometimes that does mean uh, backing a local candidate for office, which I have done around the country for, for all kinds of different offices. If I think that person is in sync with a local movement, is an expression of that movement, and is gonna advance a movement agenda. Yeah. But just, you know, picking the least worst person in every race just to do it, uh, I don't I don't think that's a good use of our energy. You are always going to be stuck in a duopoly in the US. There's always only going to be a two party system, right? And that yeah. two party system is clearly not benefiting the people. So I see where obviously the fundamental frustration comes from that um and, and it's really hard to break through that it on on one end you do have people like the squad for example they're trying to become this new uh, more vocal progressive wing of the democrats and then use their power to be able to influence uh, either legislation uh or or some other form of like you know political power soft power whatever you want to call it uh and then you've got people really really mad at that for them even existing because like you cannot possibly win when there's the corporate duality of, of the Democrats and the Republicans. I, I think people need to accept sometimes that like, you don't have to vote for Joe Biden because you like Joe Biden. I hate Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden is a massive bit and has a career in politics where he has shown himself to be a racist, to be an asshole, be a homophobe. Like all of these people, lest, lest we forget, they didn't just suddenly turn the like, I'm pro LGBTQ plus switch, right? Like Hillary Clinton was again against same sex marriage. She still says turf talking points all the time, right? But the alternative to that on the other end is a 
the Donald Trumps, is the is the Ron DeSantis's who like literally don't want trans people to exist. Right. So I, I it, like it sucks. I, if I was an American, I would begrudgingly say, yeah, Joe Biden, if I was in a purple state, by the way, if I was in a blue state, whatever, uh, then give your vote to Cornell, give your vote to, to you know, a third party uh, that you care about. Um, but that that's just the reality of the shitty hand dealt. That's why I keep saying that can't be the all like the sum total of change or what you think will enact change because because again you could have a more progressive president than joe biden that's not going to end a lot of the inequality under capitalism that's not going to suddenly end all mass incarceration especially disproportionate incarceration in marginalized communities right like it's not just going to be a switch i would love to be that case but like some people get so invested especially if they're online all the time in that dynamic like if we just voted for this person we could unlock socialism overnight or something like that when it's like that that should be one tool in the tool set of the rest of your activism or, or whatever you want to call it. I imagine that even the people who are anti-voting would probably at least agree that voting is a tool. So I imagine their position would be that voting isn't a meaningful tool in the fight for liberation or whatever more progressive role we want to see. And I just can't get down with that point either. For it to be true that voting doesn't matter as it pertains to our fight for liberation, it would have to be true that the results of the US 2024 presidential election have no bearing on that fight. But that is simply not true at all. First of all, all U.S. presidential elections have major implications, not just for Americans, but for the rest of the world. There's a reason why some of your favorite political commentators on U.S. politics aren't even American. Think about that. Second, the results of this particular U.S. presidential election matter because there is no liberation where there is fascism. Let me say that for you one more again. There is no liberation where there is fascism. And, you know, like when you talk about the Supreme Court, all people, I'm sorry, but all people had to do was vote for Hillary Clinton and we'd still have Roe. Like, I'm Thank sorry, you. abortion activists worked so goddamn hard in the run-up to the 2016 election to get Hillary Clinton to move left on abortion rights. Because she was one of those, you know, rare, safe, rare, and whatever the stupid phrase is, you know, legal, safe, and rare. But rarity is not, we're, we're, we're doing away with rarity because we're not stigmatizing people who get abortions for whatever reason. And also, we, we got a commitment from her, well, not me personally, but other um, people in the movement got a commitment from her to do away with the Hyde Amendment. They got that same commitment from Biden, and Biden tried, but ultimately Republicans blocked it. But that was a huge deal. 2016 was the first year that we got that, you know, the movement got a presidential candidate to agree to, to tell Hyde to go f itself. So it matters. And so what did we get? A six- 6-3 court. A 6-3 court. We wouldn't have that. And so instead of, I don't know, instead of reflecting upon how it was we got there, and I did reflecting myself because I was one of those people that thought Hillary was a shoe in right? And so by my money, I spent a lot of times being like, eh, Hillary, eh, Hillary, I don't really like her that much. Like, as a black woman, she, her feminism doesn't really speak to me, yada, yada. Me and too. I'm wondering, you know, should I have should I have pushed for her harder once it was clear that she was the nominee? Because in the primary, I was like, I don't care about Hillary Clinton. But then once she was the nominee, yeah, I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. But even after I said that, after she'd already won, people were talking to me like I was an asshole for saying that I was going to vote for this woman when she was the Democratic nominee. And so I think if people would reflect how blasé they were about the election in 2016. I was too. I think a lot of us were because, I mean, who the f really thought this carnival barker was really going to get in the presidency? I mean, at the, in the initial stages, right? I just want people to reflect on their behavior and then not repeat those mistakes because right. seven years is a long time and people have forgotten. Like they have yeah. on forgotten what it was like. Yes. And, and, and I think that's problematic. And I want to be clear here. I think voting is a tool. And it's important to use that tool pragmatically. And in recognizing that, I do recognize that what's pragmatic for one person is not necessarily pragmatic for the next person. It is your choice how you exercise that tool. If that means supporting any of the third party candidates, that's fine by me for the reasons just stated. But I wanna add, for the people worrying that third party candidates are going to cause the Republicans to win, they're, they're definitely not. That's no, no they're not. I ran as a Green Party candidate back in 2015 in, in, in Canada, so I'm very aware that when it comes to Green Party voters, most of those people aren't going to vote unless there's a Green Party candidate. Like, yeah. the, there's very little poll I find from other parties into the Green Party. It's basically a party where, you know, a lot of the activists vote, a lot of people who, who just, they want to feel like they're engaged in some way, but they wouldn't vote otherwise. That's where a lot of that vote is. Further. If any of these candidates between Cornel West, Marianne Williamson, or RFK are spoiler candidates, it's RFK, and he's going to take votes away from Trump or DeSantis, depending on which one gets the nom. So good, good. 
We like that. Neither Cornel West or Marianne Williamson are going to get enough of the vote anywhere, let alone anywhere that matters to hurt the Dems. They're just not. They're just not. I am the type of person politically that in a representative democracy, people have choice. And I'm not just talking about reproductive choice because I know for some people that's where choice stops. They don't want people to have choice and thoughts about who they want to vote for, whether it's federal, state, regional, or local. Now, I might not rock with the person you want to vote for. I might think it's asinine as hell for you to vote for who you told me you want to vote for. But it is not my place to tell you who to vote for. And I can explain to you, try to win you over to who I might be voting for if we had that kind of conversation. But I'm not about to down you because you made a different choice. And so if I truly believe in choice in all of its forms, then that's what it is. People have a right. And if you shame on these people who wanna to try to bully people into voting one way or the other, hell, you wanna vote green, vote green. Anybody that's running on the ballot, no matter how they're running, they gotta earn the vote. They not owed the vote. And that's what makes me sick to my absolute stomach, that folks think that they own other people's votes. You do not, sir. You do not, ma'am. You do not, family or friend member. You don't own nobody's vote. You got to earn it. So you know what? I'm glad that Dr. Cornell West is running on the Green Party. Yeah, shake them all up, Dr. West. I'm glad that Marianne Williamson and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. had enough courage and gumption to challenge this current president or if it was any other president because a primary is supposed to be about the the batter the battering about of uh, the bantering about about ideas it's supposed to be a conversation it is very true that i am a, a student and fan of cornell west i consider him to be a mentor at a distance i've never actually sat underneath him but i've read just about anything that he's written i listen yeah. to his lectures much respect and admiration for him. The Green Party has never gotten more than 1% in a presidential election. The Green Party, love them, love what they stand for, but you don't hear from them. Tr somebody show me where we heard from them over the last four years. Uh, yes. Doing the groundwork necessary to actually get more than 1%. Um, yeah. That's why I can't vote for the Green Party, even though they do have one of my favorite people in the world, Cornell West, on their ticket. But. I need to give my vote, me personally. People do what they want to do, right? I yeah. think it's incumbent upon the Democratic Party to go and earn every vote, right? Yeah. I think anyone should be vote shamed per se, whatever that actually means. I'm going to say what I think for me personally, and that is I'm going to vote to stop fascism. And I don't think the Green Party can pull that off. There's no doubt that Cornel West is a brilliant scholar and has made significant intellectual contributions in uh, American higher education and American society. Not that I agree with everything that Cornel West says. Uh, I do think Cornel West's voice is important. Right, is I think you know when you hear different voices, different opinions, that people, the listener, is able to digest and uh, 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 evaluate that, right? And so this fear that we hear from the poly, uh, the party politicians or allies or supporters is, especially on the Democratic Party, is that it's going to take votes away from. Uh, uh, Joe Biden. Whereas I see this a little different. If Cornel West makes it to the stage, you know, just like when Kamala Harris uh, was on stage with Joe Biden and other Democratic candidates vying for the presidency, she challenged Joe. She challenged Joe, and what she challenged Joe on was some uh, some uh, devils in his path. On, on issues that he voted for. Uh, and ultimately, because she challenged him, he grew from that. And that's why she became his vice president. So I think that, you know, what Cornell West will do is raise some issues that we might hear, we might not hear from other candidates, you know, uh, in the arena for a uh, vying for president. And that's a good thing. The bad thing is that we're at such a critical moment in American history where there are a lot of voters that feel we can't have our, another repeat of what happened uh, from 216 to 220, <laughs> right? 
So, you know, it's like uh, there's some risk in all of this. But what's important, most important, is for Americans to be informed and not to close their eyes or, you know, have blind, be blind to real issues and say, I'm tired of hearing this, blah, 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 right? Come on. We should listen and hear what's going on and make good decisions on the basis of that and go, uh, once again, go for the lesser of the two evils. Choice is important and votes do have to be earned. So I'll never be innately against people supporting third parties like the Green Party or candidates like Cornel West or Marion Williamson. But I think it's important to explore why you're making that choice, how pragmatic or realistic it may or may not be, or how it advances your bottom line, your bottom line. You know, I came up as an activist. I came up in a radical tradition, you know, reading, studying, organizing. And I believed that I needed to be part of a political movement, political party that represented my actual beliefs. Yeah. And I hoped that at some point this party would grow and be successful, you know, that at some point the party would grow in such a way that we could be really competitive in national elections, maybe even defeat the Democratic Party. Just the way politics works in a representative democracy, um, with the, you know, this sort of two-party system, it wasn't like there was going to be a three lanes and all three were going to be competing. But what I hoped, sort of somewhat anachronistically, is that the Green Party would kind of overtake the Democrats the way kind of the Tea Party took over Republicans. Like Republicans are kind of out here now, Tea Party didn't become their own party. They just took over the Republican. Yeah, they got a Tea Party president. And they got it, you know, and so forth and so on. So I'm saying that to say that was my hope. Um, and so I voted for Green Party candidates in presidential elections, and I continue to represent Green because I want to continue to represent the issues. Every time the Green Party comes out, it's an opportunity to fight for these issues, not for a candidate, but for these issues. We don't go into presidential elections thinking we're going to win. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't vote for Jill Stein because I thought she was going to be president. I voted for Jill Stein because I thought the issues that Jill Stein raised needed to be raised. Yeah. Um, and so um, over time, I look at it a little different. One, I think that third parties are really important for local elections. We can't just think about the, the presidential election. Like we can't win for president, but we can win for mayor, city council, all that stuff, right? We can win those seats if we organize the people. And that's how you build a movement. So now we have Green Party politics throughout our grassroots. And so now at the state level, we, we start fighting, right? And, and now Democrats are gonna have to make concessions so that people don't keep voting green. They're gonna be like, all right, well, you know what? We'll stop cash bail. You know what? You know what I mean? Yeah. We'll change the tax code because these greens are winning and they're doing it. Yeah. So that has to be kind of how we approach this thing. Yeah. Um, for national elections, um, I continue to represent green. Um, but the first time that I did not vote for a Green Party presidential candidate was uh, 20, uh, 24. Yeah. I voted. I voted for Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, and it was a tough thing. I voted for Joe, but I had to hold my nose when I went into the poll. <laughs> I saw too much death. I saw too much destruction. I saw too much disillusionment from the people. Yeah. And as a person of rel relative privilege, I I felt like it was my duty to do something. I, I, it's everybody's duty, but I felt like, how dare I? you know, sit here able to still pay my bills and under Trump, maybe even have fewer bills to pay, you know, um, while, while people die. Yeah. I, I can't let voting become an exercise of my personal politics or a demonstration of my ideological purity so that I, so that I can say, well, I, I, I held it. I stayed 10 toes green while the world is on fire. Y'all say I look different here, right? That's proof of the months and months it's taken for this video to be made and to come out. And it's really because of this part right here, addressing the Democrats and Republicans of the same argument. Because I know that so much of my online audience says and believes this and expects me or anyone they consider a real leftist to share these sentiments or they get incredibly angry about it and they question your character, your intentions and your commitments. So I have spent months trying to twist myself into knots, trying to see where they're coming from why I don't quite agree, or how I can speak on this without invoking people's rage. And that became an even bigger obstacle once October 7th happened, and more people became aware of the United States' longtime involvement and support of Israel's occupation and subjugation of the Palestinian people. Now turn genocide by the definition of the United Nations and, you know, <laughs> human decency, 
But that's when it became an obstacle because that's when it felt like my entire audience turned to blind don't vote or don't vote for Biden rage and started attacking any and everyone who still thought voting was even a worthwhile conversation to have, let alone voting for Biden or the Democrats. To a lot of people, it became impossible to make a lesser of two evils or harm reduction argument or to distinguish between the threat the Republicans pose and the Democrats once Joe Biden was seen as funding a genocide of the Palestinian people. And I don't quite share all of those sentiments because if I'm honest, nothing has changed with respect to the reasons I believe that Joe Biden or whoever the Democratic nomination could ever hypothetically be is the weaker adversary between they and Donald Trump and the reasons why I think we're still in a much better spot if we have to fight them versus having to fight Donald Trump. And maybe that's a better way to look at it. Instead of the lesser of two evils or the better option, Let's think of it as the weaker adversary, the easiest person to defeat, but the viability of that choice has changed. I talked about this in my Palestine video, which you should watch if you haven't. I really think it's some of my best work if I do say so myself, but it's become clear to me that Joe Biden seems poised to lose this election if it's between he and Donald Trump. Understand that I am not saying that because I want that to be so. That's just what seems evident to me between the many people outright refusing to vote for him or who simply just don't feel compelled to get out and vote for him. Because whether you're a Democrat or not, whether you believe that Joe Biden has done a good job as president or not, I think we can all agree, we should all be able to agree that Joe Biden and the Democrats have not done a good job on selling the public of that. Lots of presidents do bad things. Lots of presidents fuck up. Lots of presidents just do nothing for the people. But if the government and the media play their cards right and they package and sell them just right, they can be beloved figures in spite of all that. Cat Williams has a joke where he compares choosing an American president to being in a toxic relationship. And he wonders why we can't just date a president first. And now president and all they want us to do is pick a new president i feel like didn't we just get out of a fucked up relationship maybe we don't need a president right now can we be single as a country for a while and maybe date a president see how that work out for a couple months this shit is bullshit but we do date presidents that's what the first term is that's their time to love bomb us early and get us trip, trip, trip off them. So by the time they're doing all kind of fuck shit and war crimes and gaslighting us to our face, we wait too deep. It's way too late and they're sailing into their second term. Think about it. American presidents are required to love bomb the American public right out the gate. That's what the first hundred days is. That's why they're signing mad executive orders for all to see the moment they take office. They're love bombing us. And Biden didn't play the game right. And it's little shit. It's little shit that might seem petty or insignificant to people that impacts how everyday people feel. Remember how before the election, Joe Biden promised that if he was elected, he'd give everybody $2,000 stimulus checks. But once he was in office, he only gave us $1,400 checks, claiming that the $600 we'd received before he even took office applied. Compare and contrast that to Donald Trump, who, along with all the other Republicans, completely opposed giving the stimulus checks all to fucking gather. But once the Democrat majority passed it anyway, he fought to make sure that his name would be on people's checks so people receiving the money would perceive it as Donald Trump gave them that money. So, one was nickel and diamond us and the other wouldn't give a shit, but the one who wouldn't give a shit knew how to make it look to the public like he gave them everything. Listen, Donald Trump might be a son of a bitch, but he's a son of a bitch who knows how to play the game. I say all this to say, Joe Biden has not managed to truly capitalize on the nostalgia of the Obama years and the long rope people were willing to give him just because he wasn't Trump and endear himself to the American public. Don't nobody really f with Biden for real. Let's look at this for what it is. Biden's the person you date after a really toxic relationship, a really fucked up relationship because you think they're so boring. They're just so meh. They seem safe. So color you shocked to learn that they asked too. He was never America's first choice. Shit, nor the second. I wanna remind y'all that before 2020, Joe Biden had run for president in 1988 and 2008. And both times America said, please, please, please carry us. Biden is the president for a specific cocktail of reasons. 
it's not just that people wanted Donald Trump out of office because he's a bigot who stoked hate his entire time in office. I don't like how much my side of the political aisle likes to downplay the significance of Trump's rhetoric by saying that Democrats and Republicans are the same just without the violent rhetoric. And there is some truth to Democrats choosing more palatable and discreet and covert rhetoric and dog whistles, but we too easily dismiss the impact of a bold white supremacist inspiring and invoking that hate in millions of people and generations to come. If you understand the importance of speech when you want your faves just to speak on an issue, you shouldn't downplay the real and tangible impacts of a bigoted leader of one of the most powerful countries in the world. But it was 2020. We were in a global pandemic and yes, we are still in that pandemic, but we were in the thick of COVID. Hundreds of thousands of people were dying, millions worldwide, lockdowns across the country, job losses, businesses closing, widespread fear and panic. And this Donald Trump is telling people to drink bleach. Don't, don't piss me off. <laughs> Suddenly, Donald Trump's presidency felt like the beginning of the world flipping upside down. Suddenly, a political world that used to dog whistle and gaslight quietly began barking and broadcasting hate everywhere in plain sight. The president was now a Twitter troll, hate crimes up nationwide, and the next thing you know, you're in a global pandemic, feeling like you woke up in an end of the world, bird box ass movie, and you have no idea what the f to do. So if you're feeling like that, you will clamor for any sense of normalcy, returning to yesteryear, the time before it. And Biden might not know how to play the game, but you better bet your bottom dollar Barack mother Obama does. And that's why America loves Obama. In spite of all the war crimes, the average American neither knows nor gives a f about. And just by being associated with America's love for the Obama years, Biden was able to get in. But most people never actually with Joe Biden himself. Most were apathetic and many downright couldn't stand his 1994 crime bill doing ass. He was always on thin ice. He was never Obama. You think we would let people talk about Sasha or Malia the way people bust Hunter Biden's back in? People wouldn't even let you talk about Bo and Sonny like that. Meanwhile, don't nobody know the Biden's pet's names just for knowing its sake? In fact, I'm gonna be real with y'all. There was one of them award ceremonies earlier this year and they brought Jill Biden out, but they announced her not by her name, but as the first lady of the United States of America. And I just knew Michelle was about to come out. I say all this to say, Biden was never truly popular. Now, combine that with the fact that he's 81 going on 111, and now this shit in Palestine, I just don't see it happening for him. Granted, a lot can change between now and the presidential election. Biden's popularity is low and continuing to sink. At the moment, he has about a 40% approval rating and no president has been reelected with those kinds of numbers. But presidents who've been reelected have polled at similar numbers this far out from the election. People have short attention spans and a lot of people swearing up and down they won't vote for him or that it doesn't matter if Trump wins may not feel that way in a year. But for now, it's not looking good for Biden. Which is why I said in my Palestine video that I understood people refusing to vote for Joe Biden unless he stops funding Israel's genocide of the Palestinian people or calls for a ceasefire or refusing to support the Democrats unless they provide a different nominee or call for a ceasefire and ask Joe Biden to step down or call for it. I said I understood it and I explained why the strategy makes sense to me. That's not me endorsing the strategy or telling people to do it. I'm not. The reasons that I understand is because I really, really do not have the time to beat folk over the head into voting for Joe Biden if that's not what they're going to do. And I'm not going to give myself a headache getting mad or telling myself people are going to vote for him if they're not. I only have the time and energy to contend with the actual reality. And in real life, wouldn't it be better for the Democrats to know now, earlier than later, that niggas not trying to vote for Joe Biden? Isn't it better to let the Democrats know earlier that they're not feeling moved or encouraged to vote by the propaganda and actions they're currently taking and that they'll need them to switch it up if they plan to get their vote? Personally, I much, much rather get the memo earlier than later so I can at least try to adjust accordingly. Especially when Joe Biden says he doesn't think he'd even be running if it wasn't for Trump because it's precisely a Trump and Joe Biden matchup that the American public don't seem to give a fuck about right now. Politicians are supposed to give people shit they want in order to get their vote. That's how a transactional relationship works. Ceasefire vote, ceasefire vote, ceasefire vote. You do the ceasefire, you get the vote. I get it, I get it, I get the logic. Besides, we cannot tell folks that voting is a tool and then get mad when they use it as such and leverage their votes. 
Some people are single issue voters, or they decide to operate strategically by presenting themselves as single issue voters to force politicians to act. You don't have to agree with the issue that people are choosing to die on the hill for to understand and respect the tactic is legitimate. But just know that for a lot of people right now, the genocide happening in Gaza has radicalized them into either single issue voters or presenting themselves as such for the moment in order to pressure Biden to stop aiding Israel. Mind you, I wanna be clear that I am not arguing that I believe that the majority of the Democrats voter base supports Palestine or have been radicalized by support for Palestine into not supporting Biden. I don't think that at all. America as a nation supports Israel and it always has. Republicans and Democrat administrations across the board. But that's not because those particular parties choose to back Israel. It's because America must support imperialism. There was no logical reason for any of us to assume Joe Biden and the United States Congress was going to respond to October 7th any differently than it has. What's new is they're losing the propaganda war. It's important to remember that for as mad as we are on the left at Biden, Congress is in damn near perfect harmony with all these pro-Israel decisions, including censuring the only Palestinian member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, with the assistance of 22 Democrats. So I am not at all under the impression that the majority of Americans, or even the majority of the Democrats' voter base, are voting or not voting for Biden based on Palestine. Although I definitely think it's going to cause them the Muslim vote, especially in swing states like Michigan. But I think the largest issue will be voter apathy, because they just haven't been giving anything to vote for, coupled with this kind of shit. I don't want to minimize the efforts of Americans who want America to be better or to be a reflection of them and their individual values or who are hanging their hats on Palestine. I just want to add some context to everything because sometimes I feel like it's important that we zoom out and remember exactly what America is when we get to discussing American political parties and what we want and expect from American governments. For example, in the Bahamas where I'm from, we have a parliamentary system, but we have a two-party system just like y'all that we bounce between nonetheless. Your Democrats and Republicans are our FNM and PLP. The FNM and the PLP are very different parties, and I don't think any Bahamian would seriously say that they're the same. Even if they have things in common and you may get some similar outcomes, see similar kinds of corruption, or feel similar feelings of dissatisfaction at the end of their administrations. The PLP is more likely to be supported by working class Bahamian people, while the FNM is more likely to be supported by middle class and well-to-do Bahamians, as well as immigrants like my father, who wouldn't feel welcomed by the PLP's more consistent embrace of xenophobia. Each party has fundamental differences, but both are homophobic, sexist, misogynist, patriarchal, anti-abortion, and fundamentally regressive, as both must, at the baseline, reflect what the nation is. And the Bahamas is a constitutionally Christian nation. In fact, I do believe we're the only one in the world, which is a fact we boast. It's a Christian nation. It's in our constitution that Bahamian men can have children with non-Bahamian citizen women and pass citizenship down to their children. But if I, a Bahamian woman, has children with a non-Bahamian man, I can't pass citizenship to my kids. And to understand how fundamentally ingrained and consistent with the beliefs of the Bahamian people these ass backwards misogynist ass views are, while I was in college, we actually had a referendum to change that in the constitution. And Bahamians, including women, voted overwhelmingly to keep it. The Bahamas doesn't consider rape and marriage rape. We call it marital rape, refuse to outlaw it and regularly debate and defend the merits of it in parliament. If young Bahamian girls are raped and assaulted by grown ass men, the country calls them fast and fresh and blames them. The reason why our two major political parties are different but the same when it comes to certain fundamental ideals is because for a party to survive and thrive in this nation, they must at minimum reflect the ideals the nation is made up on. And the Bahamas is not made up on my personal progressive ideals. It was formed atop the regressive ideals of Christianity and all that comes along with it. Americans sit in America saying that Democrats and Republicans are the same because they're committed to imperialism, capitalism, policing, and white supremacy supremacy, all the while never realizing that those things are America. It's what the country is. It's quite literally how the country exists. That's the why the two major parties in this country's two-party system are all invested in those particular ideals, because that's what America is. Imperialism refers to a policy or ideology of extending rule over people in other countries using diplomacy or military force for extending political, economic access or power 
often used in military force. America maintains militarized U.S. embassies in at least 192 countries across the world, whether any of those countries truly want them there or not including my own country, the Bahamas, which has never been under US rule, nor do we receive any special treatment or immigration benefits of any kind from America. It doesn't seem to even stop Ron DeSantis from threatening to level us at a million hypothetical scenarios nobody asked him for. So why is it there? Why do we allow it? Why do we allow this base? Because we don't actually have a choice. No one does, not really, not without the threat of violence which is why America has been at war 226 of its 244 years of existence. Americans just don't realize that because they never get to feel or experience it because that's the privilege and benefit that comes along with being a citizen of the world power that's doling out these atrocities. You don't know. Not unless and until a 9-11 happens, at which point American propaganda still says everyone else are terrorists and brutes lashing out and that's all there is to it. America does not just support genocide in Palestine. America is in and of itself a genocidal nation. Everything that you think makes America so damn great, so damn powerful, so damn worthy of celebration every July 4th is made possible by not just historic commitments to imperialism, capitalism and white supremacy, but everyday active efforts. The reasons Americans are able to sit in a country that abuses, criminalizes, kills, incarcerates, and deports the very migrants it advertises itself to worldwide as a melting pot and whose migration it's made necessary by decades of interference in their own countries and just say they'll up and move to and work in other countries like Canada and Europe for fun or because they're mad about who won an election because your American passport can do that. That is a reflection of the imperialism that you think only two political parties believe in, when really it's what's holding up this nation and the privileges that Americans don't even stop to notice such, much less give up. Since October 7th, Israel has killed more than 14,000 Palestinian people. Joe Biden, and Congress obviously, sent $14.5 billion to Israel to aid their attacks on Gaza. Initially, Following the October 7th Hamas attacks, Biden only asked Congress for an additional $2 billion to aid Israel's attacks on Gaza. But by October 20th, this m Biden rolled his old ass on into Congress and asked for 14 whole ass billion dollars. And they gave him 14.5. But here is the thing. The United States sends Israel $3.8 billion every year. I hate to gag the liberals and nostalgic Obama lovers, but that annual $3.8 billion we give Israel every year? Your boy Obama established that in 2016. He came up with that agreement with Netanyahu. Mind you, the United States has always funded Israel's militarized occupation. But it's not just Palestine. It's far from just Palestine. Quoting from an article by an author whose name I will not butcher, so it will be on the screen. Quote, in the spring of 1805, U.S. Army officer and diplomatic consul William Eden, in alliance with Hamat Karamanli, the deposed brother of Yusuf Karamanli, Tripolitania, or today's Libya, marched an army to attack Derna. They easily captured the Tripolitanian city with the help of three U.S. ships, and the Pasha was forced to capitulate. The incident, which led to the end of the First Barbary War and a victorious United States, has been viewed by many scholars as the first U.S. attempt at a coup in a foreign government through military interventionism, triggering the country's consequent pursuit of global domination. Since then, the United States has launched more bloody overseas military intrusions, often swooping in on a country and launching deadly attacks until the target is thrown into chaos and its government overthrown. From the end of World War II to 2001, the United States has initiated 201 armed conflicts in 153 locations, accounting for more than 80% of the total wars that's occurred across the world in that time. Since 2001, Washington and its allies have dropped an estimated average of 46 bombs on other countries daily. Those wars mainly in the name of democracy, freedom, and human rights were instead a reckless interference in the domestic affairs of other countries, leaving behind death and the destruction in the Middle East, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. For example, US-led NATO forces carried out continuous airstrikes for 78 days against Yugoslavia. The result? More than 8,000 civilians dead or injured and nearly 1 million displaced. The US launched a war in Afghanistan, killed around 50,000 Afghan civilians from 2001 to mid-April 2020, and reduced some 11 million to refugees. 
Furthermore, years of bloodshed have left more than 200,000 Iraqi civilians dead and dragged Libya into greater turmoil. The United States is, quote, the most warlike nation in the history of the world, said former U.S. President Jimmy Carter in 2019, adding that his country had only enjoyed 16 years of peace in its 242-year history. The U.S. history of looting is associated with numerous military interventions and the organizations of coups to eliminate those governments that did not easily accede to their demands. And that's not even to say anything of the Congo, Honduras, and all kind of other countries. Biden's response is unfortunately a very American one. And it's not just worth mentioning what Trump's also very American positions and responses have been. And that's not me trying to scare you by going but Trump. That's just what's necessary because he's Biden's real opponent. Like it or not, that is what we get if Biden loses. So if I want to contend with reality and not just ideology, I'm required to discuss what actually happens if we make one choice versus the other. You have chaos, bloodshed, war, terror, and death. Look what's happening today. Because the occupant of the White House is a laughing stock. All over the world, America's enemies cannot believe how lucky they got. They got real lucky. Every monster, villain, dictator, and terrorist, and there are plenty of them. I know most of them. I got to know a lot of them. All over the planet, they're having a field day because they know they will never have it better than they do with Crooked Joe, who in many cases received money from those countries. And unfortunately, with the most corrupt and incompetent president in our history, we're closer to World War III than anyone can understand. There's never been a time where we've been closer. We're inches away, and we have a man that literally can't speak. He can't get off a stage. The Hamas terrorist invasion of Israel territory, Israeli territory, and the murder of Israeli soldiers today, and uh, the brutal murder of citizens is an act of savagery that must and will be crushed. Has to be, it has to be dealt with very powerfully. This is a time where the United States needs leadership. We don't have leadership. So you have a war that's going on, and you're probably going to have to let this play out. You're probably going to have to let it play out because a lot of people are dying. There is no hatred like the Palestinian hatred of Israel and Jewish people, and probably the other way around also. I don't know. You know, It's not as obvious, but probably that's it, too. I didn't want to do a huge thing on Palestine here, but it's just at the forefront of too many people's minds in terms of this election for me to not discuss it. In order to unpack Vote Blue no matter who, or to even engage with the issue of whether voting or voting in this election matters, I have to address this argument that Democrats and Republicans are the same. Otherwise, everything I say about voting, Republicans, and the threat of fascism will be met with the voice in the back of your head going, so, so, why does it matter when Democrats and Republicans are the same? I'm gonna speak more specifically and less anecdotally about the platform's beliefs and happenings around the presidential candidates themselves a little later on, but I first wanted to provide my personal and professional experience and perspective on the topic because like i said this all comes down to who we are how it impacts us and what we know democrats and republicans are not the same for me they absolutely have similarities and are aligned on some significant shit, but they are not the same or at least their differences are material but let's think for a second the leader of the republican party our last president donald j trump was impeached not once but twice incited a insurrection and is facing a litany of criminal charges. The man's got like 91 criminal charges. Like, that's unprecedented and we're still letting this run and there are people like on the left who are just kind of like, yeah, well, you know. What have Democrats done? That's always the question. What have Democrats done? Have you looked it up? Have you tried looking at, I mean, maybe it's not enough. And certainly there are plenty of things that I would like to be done. I would like more to be done. Yeah. But, just because you want more to be done doesn't mean you abandon the whole project. That doesn't make it. What what do people plan to get done? People talk about this revolution, burning it all down. What are you going to burn it down? A phoenix is going to rise from the ashes. People have been talking about burning shit down since 2015. That's like eight years ago. Where is this revolution people keep talking about? Where is it? <laughs> the n has a mugshot. The n has a mugshot. There are some of you that don't want mother to work at Walmart if they have a mugshot. It could be your president, though. But I hear this sentiment that they're the same expressed often, often to me. And it frustrates me deeply, especially in regard to policing and immigration. I have represented probably more than a thousand people facing criminal charges and been tasked with getting them out of jail. And as any defense attorney will tell you, it's so easy to put somebody in jail. All police have to do is make an arrest. 
but it's very difficult to get people out of jail. Even when all the parties agree to the release of somebody from jail, there's so much red tape and hurdles to jump over to get people out. And I represent individual people. So each of those individuals' freedom, I'd have to actively pursue. It matters whether five or 15 of my clients are in jail because each of those people are real people I have to speak to, whose families I have to speak to, whose lives are really impacted, whose communities are impacted. They're not abstract, they're not make-believe, they're not imaginary, they're not guesstimations. Each of those lives matter. And for the purposes of trying to save them, get them their freedom, it makes a big difference whether there are five or 15 people who it's going to be incredibly difficult to free. I want to get as many people as I can out of jail and each of those people matter. If I have 15 people in jail, if I have 15 clients in jail and I get 14 out of jail, I don't say, oh, I'm done. Vast majority, you know what I mean? I, that one person in jail is one person I have to figure out how to free. I have work to do. Each of those people matter. I once represented a man who was facing significant time in prison because he stood accused of stealing an iPhone while armed with a gun. No one was physically harmed in the crime, but he still only had two choices, plead to the charge and accept years in prison or go to trial where I was certain because the judge had intimated as much that if convicted, he would be sentenced to significantly more time. I remember listening to the more senior attorney explain to the man who was understandably angered by both choices because he wanted a third option one that didn't exist, where he would be freed, where he wouldn't be in prison for years of his life in exchange for the loss of an iPhone. And that was the moment for me that I truly understood what it means to be between a rock and a hard place. A rock is hard and so is a hard place. It's all bad and is all bad. That's when I realized that my clients, poor black and brown people, will always be between a rock and a hard place in the courtroom because so much of what we're battling in the courtroom is already predetermined by the laws, practices, and policies the public has already chosen in its legislators, judges, and prosecutors to enforce, to over-police my clients and land them in the courtroom in the first place. I realized that me and my clients would always find ourselves between a rock and a hard place unless I started trying to politically educate the public so the public could change their minds and stop supporting and calling for the things that fuel and legitimize mass incarceration. And I practice and work in New York City, a place where Democrats are in power in just about every office or meaningful way. So what happens often is I try to educate the public as to why the five people shouldn't be in jail or how the Democrat administrations we're fighting want the five in jail. And instead of actually engaging with what I'm saying or what we need to do, there are people who jump up and go, see, Democrats are the same because we have to fight them too because they support policing too. And that is infuriating to me as someone who actually has to get people out of jail, who believes that each person's life matters and freedom matters, and that for someone who actually wants to free people, who sees individual lives and, and not just the abstract numbers, there is a meaningful difference between an administration that wants to put five people in prison versus one who wants to put 15 in prison. And when you tell me there's not, I can't help but wonder whether you've taken the time to dislodge your head out your own ass or why you cannot critique Democrats and a Biden administration for any and every way that they continue to support the status quo without suggesting that there's no meaningful difference between what they and the Republicans want to do and do. I believe that the people who say this believe that they're virtue signaling to the rest of us that they're the real progressives, that they really care about people. But all it tells me is that you aren't actually involved in any fight on the ground in no tangible or material way if you aren't aware of the magnitude of difficulty and difference there is in fighting a Democratic administration versus a Republican one. If the lives of the 10 more people we could free fighting the Democrats instead of the Republicans do not matter to you. We cannot even fight the misinformation, the white supremacy and the bigotry being circulated like wildfire on Twitter because one right wing jackass took it over and you think you're gonna fight Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis? Like you think that's the same as fighting Joe Biden? But on the federal level, we're speaking of people like Ron DeSantis, who is yeah. clear the kind of violence he wants to utilize, right, yeah. in order to wage his war on wokeness. Um, and so that brings him to the third issue. It's not just climate change. It's just not just justice, um, but it, it's it, it's also creeping fascism. Let me rephrase it. It's not even creeping. It's glaring, blaring, theocratic fascism. They do intend of overthrowing this democracy if necessary. Um, and when I see the two parties, I see a status quo party that is 
happy with the way things are. And you and I both know, and everyone who's watching knows, things the way they are suck, right? Yeah. That's the Democratic Party. They're like, oh, it's okay. The Republican Party is actively trying to do everything they can to make this life unlivable. Yes. T is the point with them. And Ben's not being hyperbolic. Ron DeSantis' literal platform for president on his website literally says he's going to replace the woke mind virus. The woke mind virus. And I know for a fact that the cruelty is the point with people like DeSantis and that I have the right read on him because I called Ron DeSantis every kind of evil insidious monster and he put it in a compilation in his campaign ad for president. I'm dead the f ass was the original Terminator. DeSantis is like the T-1000. Ron DeSantis is far more dangerous than Donald Trump. They're just like, oh, well, at least DeSantis isn't crazy like Trump. And I'm like, no, you should be more scared of him than Trump. He's like the worst version of Trump. Ron DeSantis is despicable. Uh, he's disgraceful. The real reason this man is so terrifying is because he's managed to succeed in areas where Trump has failed. I honestly believe DeSantis was forged in hell. There's no doubt in my mind. Look at my face. We think DeSantis is more dangerous than Trump, to some degree because he's less incompetent. If anyone out there thinks that somehow he is any better than Donald Trump, then they don't know Ron DeSantis. That's who you think you can negotiate with. Someone marketing themselves based on your fear of the evil things they plan to do. He didn't disagree with what I said. He didn't add any context to it, defend himself, no. Because he's someone who sees a black woman calling him evil as an endorsement. Because that is precisely the kind of thing his white supremacist voter base value. That's today's Republican Party. I did an entire documentary on all the ways New York City's Democrat mayor, Eric Adams, is a tyrant who wants nothing more but to embolden a police state at the expense of black people, brown people, migrants, and impoverished people. And I did not make that documentary for you to come to the illogical conclusion that Republicans are the same because they are both cops, as though the Republican administration we would have had under Adams' opponent, Curtis Sliwa, or even Governor Kathy Hochul's opponent, wouldn't have been unimpeachable in their fascism and bigotry. Yes, the Democrats like de Blasio, Cuomo, Hochul, Eric Adams all try to enact rollbacks to bail reform. And the also Democratic council with people like Tiffany Caban, Julia Salazar fight to save it and veto the regressive things Adams tries to do, like expanding solitary confinement. Yes, I have to fight Democratic administrations to save bail reform, but it's also only the presence of a Democratic administration that made it possible for us to get bail reform that would be non negotiable if we had to get Republicans to do it in the first place. So yeah, New York City has has is definitely not a shining uh, example of this, a city on the hill for others to emulate. I mean, um, you know, uh, we did not have a good candidate for mayor to vote for. There was no one on the ballot who who had, I think, particularly progressive ideas. And so there was very little to distinguish the candidates in my mind. You know, we got a terrible mayor as a result. We got a yeah. cop for a mayor. But if you look where there were real races, where there were real candidates to vote for, real progressive candidates, leftists, DSA members, people with a long history of racial and economic justice, or those people won city council races. There are a lot of very progressive people on the city council, not progressive in the Kente cloth, Nancy Pelosi sense, right? But, but actually people who embrace abolition, who see that there are fundamental problems with austerity politics and the neoliberal model of, of economic development for cities. There is resistance in the city council. There are people putting forward new ideas. And I think over time, we're going to see the politics of the city reflect more closely the politics of the population because when we talk to New Yorkers through polling and other mechanisms, we find out that they would like to see something other than policing to create safety in their communities. They would like their neighborhood community center opened up and fully staffed. They would like to see mental health resources. They would like to see substance abuse resources. And, you know, and Mayor Adams is not providing that. But if you think that I find Eric Adams' xenophobic desire to keep migrants out of New York City or to be excused from providing them shelter evil, what do you think I would feel if Curtis Sleewell was in office advocating we put the migrants in Rikers? Which is what he's doing. We need to be so f for real. Watch it. We will
restore law and order to our communities, and I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every radical, out-of-control, fake, crooked prosecutor in America for their illegal, racist, in reverse enforcement of the law. I am also going to indemnify all police officers. This is a big thing, and it's a brand new thing, and I think it's so important. I'm going to indemnify through the federal government all police officers and law enforcement officials throughout the United States from being destroyed by the radical left for taking strong actions against crime. When I tell you how awful the Democrats are, that should alarm you as to just how awful the Republicans are. Not serve as license for you to downplay the threat that is Republicans. Are the Democrats fighting tooth and nail to oppose change and maintain the status quo? Oh, baby, you bet your bottom fucking dollar they are. But the Republicans not gonna fight us at all. They not gonna fight us on it. They gonna shoot you on sight, baby. And you know that. You saw January 6th. These are the people who take up arms to storm the Capitol, who don't believe in the peaceful transference of power, who set up death traps on migrants in the water, who have Nazis marching proudly. Y'all forget my died at the insurrection. Y'all remember that shit happened? Oh, okay. Y'all remember they was planning to kill people? Okay, okay. I made that Eric Adams documentary for the same reasons that I recognized that political education was necessary if I wanted to improve the battles my clients were facing in the courtroom. Because the reality is that the majority of the country does not see things the way I do. I am outnumbered in the courtroom just as I am outnumbered in real life. More people have been indoctrinated to believe in the vision Eric Adams presents them than the vision I have because they haven't had much exposure to my vision. I need to shift social consciousness past Eric Adams to get it to where mine is or where it needs to be to help my clients. But I'm if every time that I try to expose what's wrong with the Eric Adams visions to the people that I can at least reach and potentially shift, a group of assholes say, ah, there's no difference between Eric Adams' vision and Curtis Sliwa's vision because you know what happens then? We either stay stuck in place at Eric Adams' vision, or worse, we roll even further down the hill into fascism. Progress is a literal uphill battle, so let's envision it as such, shall we? If you visualize a hill, put liberation at the tippy top to get there. We the people have to push an enormous boulder up that hill. If liberation is at the top, fascism is at the bottom. And that's where the Republicans are. Above them on that hill is the status quo. That's where the Democrats are. We want to get past that point. If we're standing there on the hill, essentially holding the fort on that boulder, trying to figure out how to push past that point in the hill, and you say there's no difference between that point and the bottom of the hill where fascism is, we might stay put holding the boulder off. But what's more likely is some people stop helping us try to push the boulder upward or hold it off, they simply let go and we roll down the hill into fascism. I have been frustrated with this argument both professionally and personally for a while. For a while, especially when I see it in relation to policing and immigration. In 2016, I was in law school in New York City, in Queens. <laughs> but I was visiting my beloved alma mater, Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, to speak to students for pre-law day. And I remember being in the McDonald's drive through with two of my friends who then told me they were not going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And I remember it like it was yesterday. One of my friends was from Brooklyn, but she had chosen to register in Ohio, swing state. I was outnumbered two to one. And at the time, I really could not fathom that Hillary could lose to a bumbling orange buffoon anyway, especially if I was to believe, and I did believe, that Hillary and the Clintons were as sinister and powerful as I'd been told. So I didn't bother to argue with her as she insisted on voting for Jill Stein in Ohio, not New York City. Because as she and my other friend were the first to ever put it to me, Democrats and Republicans were the same. It made no difference whether Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump won. In the days following Donald Trump's election, I was distraught. I came to the United States in 2008 specifically because I wanted to go to law school and become a lawyer in America. And when I looked into the US's impossible immigration system, one that I am still navigating 15 years later, I knew it would be easier if I at least entered the American school system earlier. So I convinced my parents to let me leave home just shy of my 15th birthday. I will never be able to find the words to describe the amount of stress I have been under since the moment I made that decision. The magnitude of impossibility it is navigating the U.S. immigration system. But imagine, as was the case then, that you've put in 10 years of pain to this long-term vision, and you're about to approach the hardest part of that journey, finishing school and trying to find the 
needle in a haystack that is a work visa or any path to permanent residency, citizenship, anything in this country, if you're someone who came on a student visa and Donald Trump gets elected. A man who made his platform explicitly on the promise that it was immigrants to hell and back. And you're a black immigrant at that. The most impacted and under discussed targets of the US immigration system. I was devastated. I remember being parked in my Volkswagen Beetle that I could not afford to keep weeping, like weeping, I mean booing. And then my friend called, the one from Brooklyn, who had voted for Jill Stein in Ohio because it made no difference whether Hillary or Trump won. And to my surprise, that friend was boo fucking hooing too. Talking about she's devastated and I should go to DC with her to put on pink pussy hats and march. And I said, ain't that about a bitch? Ain't that about a bitch? I know why I'm boo hooing, but why is she? No, seriously, why is she? If you believed, if you believed that there is no difference truly, what would you have to be crying about? What do you have to march about? What do you have to protest about? And there were a lot of people who said shit like that and cried and marched in pussy hats. And there are a lot of people who continue to say things like that while devoting their every waking second to following electoral politics and the happenings of these elections. If they were the same, it truly wouldn't matter what happens in these elections. And it wouldn't matter to you, the person saying that, what happened in these elections. You wouldn't care. You wouldn't put your energy into arguing any positions, into giving a flying f And that is not a knock to people who vote third party or people who voted for Jill Stein. That's specifically a knock to people who lie through their teeth and say Democrats and Republicans are the same or that it makes no difference which is in office when they know that's a lie from hell that they do not believe in that's why they're crying that's why they're marching in pink pussy hats the people who truly do believe they're the same who truly think it doesn't matter truly don't give a f and they're not following this stuff they're not commenting on this stuff at all they're not going out to vote so let's just stop being disingenuous shall we it's the lying I can't get behind. It's the lying and the posturing as though people who vote for Democrats or believe in harm reduction or voting for the lesser of two evils are nonsensical enemies of progress. How any individual feels about a political party or an administration is based on how they experience them. So I'm not going to say that there aren't any people out there whose material needs and circumstances are unaffected, or at least as far as they know, based on whether Republicans or Democrats are in office, but they're not me. They're not the people feeding you this messaging on the internet and in the media, and they're not the most marginalized people among us. There are objective material differences between the Democrats and the Republicans across the board, but I'm going to get into the substance of that later on when we discuss Republicans and the threat of fascism, while also seriously discussing the ways Democrats are in fact still our opposition seeking to maintain the status quo. For now, I just want to explain the material differences between a Republican and Democrat administration for me subjectively and for the people I advocate on behalf of and why I, a lie me, could and would never tell you they're the same, even if I wanted to win whatever litmus test y'all got going on. There's a personal cost to me as an immigrant and a professional cost to me as a lawyer and an advocate under a Republican administration. There just is. I wept when Donald Trump was elected and not a single tear was shed in vain. I came to America as an international student on a series of F1 student visas. Student visas do not come with absolutely any path to citizenship or permanent residency or a green card or a work visa. Nada, none of that. So to the Americans inevitably asking, why don't I apply for citizenship? It's because I can't. I am literally unable. I am not eligible. No immigrant can just decide we want citizenship and apply and sit a test. Otherwise we would, it don't work like that. That's American propaganda fed to you through the media so that you wonder why we don't just do it the right way. Meanwhile, 85% of all undocumented immigrants in America were documented immigrants who became visa overstays because they had no path to legally remain. In fact, we not only don't have a path to citizenship, as an international student, we're technically not even supposed to demonstrate intent to remain. In other words, don't look too comfortable, put your bags down, be ready to skedaddle. <laughs> As an international student on an F-1 visa, all you're entitled to is one year of OPT following graduation, which means 
one year that you're allowed to work a job without a work visa before you have to get the f out the country. So when I graduated law school, I had one year to work my job as a public defender before I needed to leave if I couldn't get a work visa or another means to stay here. I applied for an EB2 visa with a non-interest waiver that caused me thousands of dollars to self-petition for. When my OPT ended, I couldn't keep working, but I also couldn't leave the country or my application would be considered abandoned. That's how they get you. So I had to go on an unpaid leave and figure out how to afford to live in New York City. I plan for this though, usually this unpaid leave period while you wait to get the temporary work permit you're supposed to get while your visa application pens lasts about two to three months. So I worked like a dog to save enough money to pay a few months rent in advance of the unpaid leave. What would have been two to three months under a Democrat administration turned into seven months under Trump and $32,000 worth of lost income for me before my visa was ultimately denied because while they recognized me as an outstanding alien with an advanced degree, as they told me, my proposed endeavor as a public defender only benefited the indigent people of New York City and was thus not of substantial interest to the nation. While this is happening, several of my friends who'd schooled in America would also suffer from some heartbreaking denials before having to move back home. I eventually got sponsored a work visa and now under Biden's administration have received much swifter approvals and I'm on a better track. I've been in America 15 years and I can confidently tell you that no party or administration has lifted a finger to make the conditions and shitty system I've been battling better. But I am telling you that Republicans made it significantly worse. And I felt that impact personally. Especially as someone who was an outspoken advocate against the US criminal system, it didn't go unnoticed to me when Trump's administration suddenly required all immigrants to disclose links to all of our social media accounts. You know, um, back in 2020, I had one of my viewers reach out and say, Mike, this is basically life or death for me. Like if Biden gets back in, then he could reinstate DACA. And that literally means that I get to stay in this country. Like that's 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 somebody's entire life. Like that is not an insignificant thing. Whew. Okay, so I started as an immigration, just to like add context as to where I'm gonna be coming from. I started as an immigration attorney in 2017. So right when the Trump administration was like really getting going and you know, practicing doing what I do, which is removal defense and aka defending people from deportation in court. Um, it was pretty miserable. I mean, like on a, on a daily practical public defender type of level, it was like you couldn't negotiate at all about anyone's humanity. You couldn't try to make any sort of like, you know, in the criminal legal system, as you obviously know, you can like negotiate with the prosecutors and try to get, you know, a favorable outcome for the people that you're representing. Whereas like during the Trump administration, there was like, none of that at all it wasn't even a conversation you could even like go to try to even you know try to persuade someone it just wasn't even on the table from what i understand i think in texas uh border patrol or something they shot somebody across the border recently different local governors have been shipping migrants from the u.s mexico border we literally start purposely creating fake schools trying to catch uh people that came over with 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 the uh, education visas or with you feel me like that status through education you purposely create a fake school and you lured them to the school they tried to go to the school to keep their visa and you have deported them we seen that happen in twice. We seen it happen. So it's just like, nah, I ain't got time. Like 2016 we seen I seen so much shit crazy shit happen that was like nah I think I underestimated this all. Hey son yeah, apparently uh, Spider-Man about to come in here, you feel me? Uh, 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 Spider-Man, uh, I heard Miles Morales is uh, facing deportation too. You and this does not mean the Democrats aren't awful on immigration. They are. Or that different kinds of immigrants don't have just as hard a time under a Democrat administration, or that you should applaud the Democrats on immigration. The first group of people that both parties are willing to sacrifice on the altar of the news cycle, and I'm not even talking about just long, but in the altar of the news cycle, the immigrants. Uh, yeah. Particularly black immigrants. Uh, yeah. We saw what they did to the Haitians that came to the border in Texas and they got, they uh, deported those Haitians at the border in Texas over the one, the, the same one where they had the guy on the whip with yep. the black man. Um, yeah. Fun fact, immigration is a black issue. 7% of non-citizens in the U.S. are black, but 20% of those facing deportation on criminal grounds are black. 44% of people detained by ICE from 2020 to now are Haitian. Bonds for Haitian detainees average $16,700, 54% higher than other immigrants. Black immigrants face higher asylum denial rates as well. Among the 10 nationalities with the most asylum decisions from 2012 to 2017, Haitians had the second highest denial rate at 87%. 
In the years before that period, Jamaicans had the highest asylum denial rate. Somalians also had one of the highest asylum denial rates in that same time period. In 2017, Somalians also experienced the highest rate of deportations, according to the American Bar Association. So when Biden became president, you know, that was, at least for me as a public defender, and I'll stop centering myself in a second, but I think it's important to note that, like, yeah, I could start filing, like, packets for what are called prosecutorial discretion requests to actually try to get people out of ICE detention and to try to negotiate, you know, favorable outcomes for people who shouldn't be going through the deportation process at all. I unfortunately, uh, I don't know if unfortunately, but for them, unfortunately, I believe that no one should be deported. And I represent a number of people who have criminal convictions and criminal arrest histories. And, you know, on a practical material level for the folks that I represent within these different types of proceedings, that whole prosecutorial discretion does not exist for them at all. <laughs> at least in like, especially as the years have gone on, because they did change, you know, their internal policies within DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, which is like the major federal agency that um, houses ICE, you know, they did change their internal policies to allow for people to file those requests, but in terms of actually following their own guidance, they don't at all. They and the Biden administration would argue, well, you know, this was taken to court, federal district courts didn't rule in our favor, like we did what we could do. But what I've noticed about the Biden administration is that they kind of do that on like every issue. They throw up their hands like, eh, we did the least that we can do. And, you know, that should be good enough for you. And it is what it is. I also think that I feel like a lot of people know about this, but they've been shipping migrants from the U.S.-Mexico border to random cities throughout the United States. Not that random. They're certain, you know, they obviously target what they would say is like progressive liberal cities. And New York City has been one of them. And the Biden administration has done next to nothing to actually support the people that are coming here. And, you know, I, I understand that like a lot of people have feelings about the way that New York local elected officials talk about the need for what's called work authorization, aka okay, getting your work permit. People are delayed for six months after filing their asylum application from even getting a work permit. You know, that can be a really long time, especially if you don't have access to anyone to support you to even file the, applic the asylum application in the first place. And then you have to wait another six months. And a lot of people are saying like these local elected officials are just trying to get people back to work for the economy and don't value their lives because people need to have shelter. And they absolutely do need to have shelter. And local officials are totally failing at providing shelter for anyone. But at the same time, there's something that the Biden administration could do, which is, you know, expedite people's ability to get work authorization. The executive branch has a lot of power to make that happen. And they've done next to nothing because I, from my perspective, they just want to continue to keep migrants within a subclass of workers where they can never access anything and are just constantly working in this vulnerable state without shelter and without any means to actually you know get a job the dams don't do enough i agree i agree but hear me and hear me good republicans are fascists now for a word from my past self because i've done the biden versus trump versus DeSantis substantive comparison before and why reinvent the wheel Take it away, old me. Pretty widely known at this point that Joe Biden was responsible for the 1994 crime bill. For those who aren't familiar with the law, it's responsible for bringing us the likes of things like three strikes law, mandatory life sentences for repeat offenders, and funding more policing in prisons. And before topping the mass incarceration charts with the 1994 crime bill, Joe Biden's first smash hit was the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. That act set mandatory minimums for crack cocaine offenses with much harsher sentences compared with powder cocaine. That's suspicious. That's weird. Mind you, he had none of this smoke for his son and his drug use or any of the litany of issues Hunter Biden has. And it's not that I want him to treat his son's addiction with criminalization. It's that he wouldn't dream of doing such a thing, but he couldn't dream of handling it any other way if the person struggling with addiction looks like me. But none of that is my gripe with him present day. It doesn't matter to me what's in Joe Biden's heart, nor am I dogmatically angry with him for the past. If in the present, Biden were trying to move away from over-policing and mass incarceration, I'd be happy to take that. Unfortunately, that's just not the tea. Biden is very much so the police-loving, mass incarceration, respectability politics pushing man he's always been. And that's why it's time to pull his file. Before being elected, Joe Biden promised me, I mean us, that if he was elected, he'd give us all $2,000 stimulus checks. But when he won, broke boy Biden tells us it's $2,000 subtract 
what he already gave us. But then in May of 2020, Biden, a man who was just counting pennies with our stimulus money, praised state and local governments for committing to use at least $10 billion in federal stimulus money to bolster police departments. He encouraged them to spend even more on police and to do it quickly to beat the summer crime spike. He expressly committed to funding a whopping 100,000 additional police officers. Mind you, the police killed at least 1,195 people in 2022 that we know of, and they've already killed 320 people this year. And black people were 26% of people killed by police in 2022, despite being only 13% of the population. In May 2022, Biden signed an executive order he called the most significant police reform in decades that included a national law enforcement accountability database that would give us detailed information about police officers who commit misconduct. That database was supposed to launch on January 20th of this year. And it's May, where the database at. And he admonished protesters on every chance he could get. This violence of Looting and burning and destruction of property. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. Setting fires is not protesting. But with all of Biden's flaws, I want to be clear. For everything bad about Joe Biden, there are 10 worse things about DeSantis and Trump, who are devil and demon, evil ghoul-like creatures who mean us harm. The only question we really need to ask ourselves is, which is the devil and which is just a demon? To answer that, it's time to play a little game called, How Evil Are We? We're gonna go bar for bar on the evil. Starting off strong, Trump gave us smash hits like January 6th, a whole goddamn insurrection where these really tried to take the Capitol. Yeah, that happened. In 2021, DeSantis championed the anti-riot law, which among other things, grants civil immunity to people who decide to drive their cars into protesters who are blocking a road. U.S. District Judge Mark Walker ruled the law unconstitutional because it was so vague and overbroad, it amounted to an assault on the First Amendment rights of free speech and assembly, as well as the Constitution's due process protections because, quote, people engaged in peaceful protests are innocently the same area when a demonstration Administration turned violent could face felonies and stiff penalties. The law would have made it a felony to block traffic during a protest and added additional felonies for property damage. Speaking of unconstitutional, Trump gave us not one, not two, but three bozos on the Supreme Court. And that's why it's the kangaroo court now. But that's not all, folks. Trump hated police brutality protests more than DeSantis ever could dream of doing it. Rapid fire bonus points. Trump sent the National Guard and federal police to Kenosha to brutalize protesters. Then he gave Kenosha police one million dollars and another 41 million dollars to support all the police in Wisconsin for a job well done brutalizing the protesters. Then he sent federal police to the courthouses in Portland to beat up those protesters. Then he signed an executive order giving people 10 year sentences for destroying any federal property or monuments. DeSantis passed the Don't Say Gay Bill which prohibited discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity in schools. But Trump launched a thing called Operation Legend that led to 5,500 more arrests. But DeSantis not not only passed a host of laws restricting voting and gerrymandering the fuck out of Florida to suppress people's right to vote, he also had 19 people, mostly black, arrested for a political stunt. Vanity Fair said, quote, what happened was that DeSantis essentially exploited mass confusion around a Florida amendment that allowed some ex-felons to vote. Body camera footage obtained in October by the Tampa Bay Times showed an officer expressing surprise about the charges against the man he was tasked with handcuffing and telling someone on the phone, I've never seen these charges before in my life. Trump gave hundreds of millions of dollars worth of surplus military equipment to local police. But DeSantis passed the Stop Woke Act, which bans conversations about race in schools and businesses and allows students and workers, white students and workers, to sue if they believe a classroom lesson or workplace training course caused them to feel guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress due to their race. But Trump signed an executive order to help prevent violence against the police. But DeSantis eliminated Medicaid coverage for transgender care for people of any age and also barred transgender girls from competing in sports. And before the Supreme Court even overturned Roe, DeSantis signed a law banning abortions beginning at 15 weeks of pregnancy with no exceptions for rape or incest. But Trump gave the DOJ nearly $400 million for new police training. What do I mean when I say fascist? I mean authoritarian shit, a regime devoid of civil liberties, night night to democracy. 
And this point truly should not have to be argued. Ultimately, like when it comes to what is the actual, like very clear difference, I think between uh, whoever is in power is, uh, I mean, one thing is, is in terms of just the transfer of power. Like if one party you're questioning, are they even going to have another election? I mean, at that point, why are we even having a discussion? <laughs> like you want to make sure that party is not going to be in power. If one party is just anti-democracy, but also just the, the clear difference I, I, I see between the two is just is socially culturally is is you know is the treatment of of marginalized communities like that is i think the the clearest difference that we have seen uh comparing you know trump in power to to democrats in power and seeing the transition in terms of how culture shifted after trump won like witnessing that firsthand and openly discussing oh yeah there's you know there's some nazis out there in front of disneyland like like what like eight years ago discussing about not like nazis holding the nazi flag out in front of disneyland would be insane but no that's that's a thing that's happened and it's a normal thing now and that was not normal before trump came in so understanding like it can it can often times be hard to really see how much things have changed because it has happened you know somewhat gradually but we have i think many of us have sort of just gotten used to how extreme things have gotten we really have to go back and think just how much it has changed like go back eight years think of how much it really has changed just in in discussions culturally uh you know media things have gotten way more extreme on the right the threat of fascism is real but it's not just abstract and intellectual and academic and ideological it's two at least two people trump and DeSantis. there's more of it those just two that have a chance to win yeah who are legitimately fascist like real life fascists who could win if we don't organize against them? So what I will say is at this moment, um, I will do everything I can, both as a private voter and as a public voice to ensure that Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump are not in the White House. That's my number one priority. How that looks, what the, how that plays out, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I suspect it means I'll have to hold my nose and vote for Biden again. But if there's another way to do it, I'll do it. But the number one priority maybe even the only priority for me right now, and I, I can't say this enough, is to keep them out of the lawyers. We're dealing with a group of Republicans that are fascist. And so yes. this is the thing that drives me furious about our entire political system is that people are satisfied between bad and horrible. They're yeah. satisfied for our choices to be between bad and horrible. Would I say a Dem the Democratic Party is bad? When you look since 1980, absolutely, no question. Yeah. Would I ever let them lose to a Republican if I could help it? No, because Republicans are fascists and they are running headlong into fascism. They're also just extremely dumb. I voted for Biden. I'm going to vote for Biden again. I will get out there and knock on doors if I have to. Most certainly will. Um, but I have a very low standard of expectations from Joe Biden. My requirement for him over the last four years was to <laughs> stop the pandemic, hmm, lost that fight, and not be a fascist. Yeah. So I'm one for two. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to vote for him again with that bar being that low. I would rather vote in the future for someone who can win who actually is going to do the laundry list of things that we need done in this country. However, yeah. we don't have that choice right now. We have a choice between the status quo, which is pretty horrible for humanity, yeah. and sociopaths. Okay, my eye is on the ball. I'm going to vote for the status quo. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he gets into office, but I'm looking straight past him because I know he's not going to do the things that need to be done. Yeah, so fascism isn't just, you know, something that we think is bad. Fa we, we're not using fascism in the way that Republicans use communism and call Joe Biden a communist. With fascism, there is a certain set of criteria, right? It's not just the policies, but there's a lot of other components. It's, it's the ultra-nationalism. It is the contradictory statements about political opposition. They're really weak, but at the same time, they're really, really scary, and they pose an existential threat to us. It's the demonization of minorities, the violation of political norms, uh, the dismissal of uh, laws and the constitution. There, there's so much that the, the way that propaganda even functions, like the way that they demonize trans people is very similar to the way that they demonize Jewish people back in um, you know, uh, World War II era Germany. So fascism is very different. And if you ask a political scientist uh, whether or not the modern Republican party is fascist, 
I think that nine out of 10 of them would say yes. And that is very difficult for political scientists to agree upon because they don't even agree on a definition of democracy yet. But if you ask them, does this look like fascism in your assessment? I think most of them can see, yes, this is fascism. And because it's not just like far right or conservative politics, like it's different and poses a unique threat. We're not talking about paleocons or neocons or libertarians or neoliberals. We're talking about a group of people who are organized in opposition to democracy and human rights. And it's just about power and the accumulation of power. And that's literally it. They will do whatever they need to do to assume as much power as possible, even if that means crushing democracy. I, I think that a Trump administration or really any Republican administration, I feel like you shouldn't have to say it, but you kind of still do. Like that would be very, very bad. And even if everything isn't going to be peachy keen with the Democrat in control, it is exponentially worse with Republicans, especially now, because the Republicans of today are not the same as the Republicans from yesterday, right? Like I remember having conversations with my coworkers in 2008 about how scary it would be if somebody like Sarah Palin got in the White House, right? When I was voting for Obama, that was the first time that I voted. And nowadays it's like, oh my God, Sarah Palin is probably just an average Republican. So, I mean, the Overton window has shifted to the right. Things are much different now than they were just 10 years ago. And this moment is really unique in the sense that, you know, we, we always hear, hey, this is the most important election ever. Uh, but I feel like each election is getting more important because the stakes are higher. And this is a matter of uh, life and death, I think, for the country. And I don't feel like that's hyperbole because, I mean, when you see how the entire Republican Party has bought into this delusion that Trump won the election in 2020, and now he's stating explicitly that he's gonna arrest political opponents because he has no choice. He said that on Glenn Beck's program when he talks about basically violating the constitution to end birthright citizenship and a lot of other really horrifying things about immigration. Uh, I just feel like this is one of those moments where 20 years from now, I'm gonna look back and ask, how did I respond to that? Did I meet the moment? And there's not much that I can do as just a regular citizen, um, but I do have a platform. So the way that I respond to this is, listen, our number one goal, I think, is to defeat fascism. Everything comes second, because if we don't defeat fascism, if America becomes an authoritarian regime, then we don't even have the chance to get anything done. Education is elevation. The classroom getting attacked. Uh, they, they all, all, all the sayings. You never know where you're going unless you know where you're being. Education is the great equalizer. Well, if you don't read the books, it is. Da, 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 da. Listen, hey, whether we talking about gay, gay, gay issues, black issues, class issues, or trans issues, the classroom is really where it's being folded at. Um, uh, uh, what is it? Revolutionary Suicide, Huey P. Newton book. That's the book that really lit a fire up under my ass and changed how I seen everything. When I realized the impact they had on children, it's what made J. Edgar Hoover see them as the biggest threat to domestic security. It was about education, how they were educating black children on teaching them their rights, giving them free breakfast. To me, it's really about like what's going on in that classroom. You feel me? Like when we think about how individuals don't have the the the, the skills or have the tenacity to do X, Y, and Z, because they got failed in the classroom. You know what I mean? I think that it's it's, it's I, feel, I feel like the classroom got to do everything. To me, yeah. to my mind, like how we teach people how to understand themselves, how to understand the world, it really come from there. So we see that the military and all these different people get on all these different increases in their budget, and you was crying about defunding the police, but they defunding education, and you trying to talk about, I think the education really come here. You talk about defunding everything, hey, education been, 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 been on the constant defund for the past 30 years. Listen, man, this, in Kansas, in Kansas and in Missouri, a 17-year-old girl, two 17-year-old girls got taken to jail for them communicating on social media about getting abortions. They ain't even get the abortions. See what I'm saying? For me, it's like literally through social media, motherfucker, go subpoena your Google, you feel me? And if you was even contemplating thinking about aborting a child, they can literally take you to jail and criminalize you. Almost to the point where technically, you see what I'm saying? If you in a state like Florida and you decide that you want to do some drag, or you know what, even be real with you, you ain't even got to want to do drag or decide that you was going to do drag. Somebody else can just see and see what you do and, and they start the way that you performed your gender in that instance was not was too much on a public platform. You can be streaming. You can be streaming, doing some shit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we got one. We got him. We got him.
going to be real you going to jail like there are, there are particular ways that the medium of social media can be used as a vehicle to criminalize your ass and or literally be the thing that is criminalizing in itself it's just like all this all this shit ain't finna, ain't finna go around nowhere when they marching down people to go talk to congress about sharing data and all of those shit they can literally say hey man and even now thinking about it all the campuses in Texas, no diversity and inclusion. I seen at University of Houston, and I think Rice, they took away, the different universities for sure, they took away the LGBT community office. And I know it's extremely frustrating with the Democrats and them not doing what we exactly want them to do all the time. I mean, I complain, yell, scream on the internet all the time about it. But like, I look at it, at it as like, there are particular things that I'm really concerned about. And a lot of these things are wrapped up in policy. So I work in the environmental sphere, you know, um, and I do environmental compliance. I write documents all the time. So it's very important for me to see like legislation and policy that is gonna help people the most. And the Republicans are straight up demons when it comes to that. And I know we joke around about this all the time about them being demons and stuff like that. But I mean, they literally want to delete environmental laws. And I'm not even joking. I'm dead, dead serious. They want to delete it. Like I remember back in like maybe as soon as Trump stepped in office, I think one of the first things he did was like, you know what? That word climate change, we're deleting that. That being said, while Democrats may not be fascist, they are violently committed to the status quo. They do not adequately fight fascism. There are many ways that they differ from Republicans more in rhetoric than application, and there are many significant ways they are failing us on issues that matter most to voters, like the climate crisis, drug policy, crime and policing, immigration, the attack on the trans community, just to name a few. I mean, a few, just a few. For me, I guess I view the Democratic Party as like just as complicit, or rather complicit and not actively pursuing it, but they also are, you know, like I look at like, you know, Hakeem Jeffries and like his like outspoken support for like Zionism, like constant. I, I really view like the Democratic Party as just as involved. Anybody who does not believe that people have choice and, and for the people gonna say, oh, Senator Turner, you know, uh, Trump is a, is a, is a president. He's a threat. The Republicans are a threat. You know what they are. DeSantis is a threat. Ramaswamy is a threat. Nikki Haley is a threat. All these all of these people, I almost called them something. Yeah, they threats. So the Democratic Party need to comport themselves accordingly, like they a threat, and pass policies that animate the real lived experience of people so then we don't have to worry so much about the threat. Why are they putting the onus, Olay, on the voter to worry about the threat instead of comporting themselves through public policy in a way that they understand that neo-fascism is a threat? That's all I'm saying. Oh, I definitely agree that that's like where the right is moving and has been moving and that it's been going on for years and it's getting worse like all the time. And for me though, too, I view like people, cause a lot of this has been like happening even just in the past couple of years under the Biden administration. And it's like, what have you been doing? You know, like why haven't you been using your myriad of exec different forms of executive power that you could use to respond to any of this? Why are you not even being outspoken about any of this? Why is there no direct confrontation against right-wing fascists? The material conditions on the ground often look very similar. I will say the rhetoric shifts, right? So we are in a space where under Trump administration, it was way more antagonistic. Oftentimes under re Republican administrations, we're fighting way more for basic agreements. Uh, I think one of the words that has become really politicized and is a red meat word for folks on the right is the concept of harm reduction as a philosophy. Uh, and that is something that we don't have to fight as much tooth and nail on rhetoric, on the rhetoric side, on, on the left. However, that's where it ends, right? The way that I sort of look at both parties, really in everything, but specifically with trans issues, is that I don't really see anything that the Democrats are doing that are is demonstrably 
helping trans people. Like, there are some protections that they're trying to put into place, and I do like a lot of the sort of uh, discussion of, like, trans issues that, you know, Biden and a few other uh, Democrats have been discussing. But I also very much see this centrist position that constantly comes up more and more of, like, let's stop talking about trans issues because it's a right-wing talking point that gets a lot of, like, attention. And so they're willing often to, like, throw trans people under the bus or ignore trans people instead of actually standing up for trans people uh, because it is for what for what they see as a quote unquote losing issue. We'll be in a situation where, for example, the Obama administration, where they lifted the syringe ban, um, which was really important. It, it came back. Right. And it did come back because of Republicans coming back into power. But the truth is, is like the Dems don't really stand firm on the things that we need them to stand firm for, for the for the ground to be transformed. And also part of the thing that's um, that's difficult about the Democratic Party is that they'll take syringe exchange, for example, overwhelmingly supported by research as an effective public health intervention. They understand it, but they're not showing up for a rally for it, right? They're not um, they're not going to be fighting with us against the conservatives unless it is politically viable for them. So we're constantly in a space where while they might intellectually or theoretically see it as something that could be helpful, we're constantly in a space where Democrats position drug policy as a vulnerability for Democrats. And so while conservatives are more antagonistic, um, what I find with the Democratic Party is that while we fight them on different things, we're still fighting them tooth and nail, um, but just on a different version of the fight. Well, I think about this a lot and my mood changes about it a lot, you know, because I'm a human who's constantly evolving and growing. But I feel I, I, I understand the people who are like voting doesn't matter in the presidential election. I don't think it's an unreasonable perspective to have when you really pay attention to people's material realities. And I think it's fair for people to want to vote based on their material realities. I feel like for years now, we have always been told to vote for, quote, the lesser of two evils. Um, and I see things only getting worse as I've done that, because I've done that. You know, I'm not, I was a clown. I voted for Biden. I did, you know, because I was really like, damn, maybe, maybe we can do it. You know, like maybe this will have a real impact on a number of people, not just myself, but like the communities that I'm defending, the communities I'm working with, like, I really hope that this will have a huge material change for them. And it just didn't, you know, I don't think voting, you know, I'm also not the type of person to be like, don't vote at all. Like, I really think it's a, people should make their own decisions about that. But for me, I'm more fixated and focused on local voting. I'm more interested in referendums and I'm more interested in, you know, like ballot measures that people can vote on. You know, I look at what's happening in Atlanta and I'm like, there's a lot of differences as to whether or not that's the way to like try to stop cop city. But I think when you're fighting racial capitalism, you have to use every tool at your disposal. And I also think if people are not going to vote, it makes sense to do it in a way that's like organized and with other people and making clear, because I'm like, why should I continue voting for people who literally make the problem worse? Like they continue to contribute to the problem rather than provide solutions. The Democratic Party never embraced um, our work on the divestment from policing, but you know, they talked to it, right? So like, I will, you know, what I would ask to you is like, do, who's better on policing, right? Um, in, in when we're talking about like the transformational on the ground kind of stuff, as opposed to the rhetoric. As you know, so much of criminal justice policy is set at the local and state level. You know, most of what we think of as criminal laws and criminal adjudication in the court system happens at the state level. Uh, the feds play a role in things like drug enforcement and some uh, use of RICO, not just to go after former presidents, but, but young people in communities listening to drill music who are labeled as gangsters and, and the worst of the worst and prosecuted under these very permissive RICO statutes. So, 
But by and large, funding for prisons, the laws that drive prison rates, the policies around policing, the budgets of policing, these are local and state matters. In addition, you know, the politics in Washington are pretty terrible. And, yeah. and I and there's not even someone running for office in most places who would really, I think, make it any better. That what counts as a kind of progressive criminal justice uh, policy is mostly procedural reformism. The yeah. kind of stuff that's in the Justice for George Floyd Act, which wouldn't have saved George Floyd's life and no. probably anyone else's, frankly. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a virtue signaling of a sort, uh, but but more seriously, it's 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 just has the wrong premise. It misunderstands the nature of policing. It misunderstands the nature of the police problems we're up against, and with the exception of a handful of very progressive le legislators like Cory Bush, like AOC, uh, there is not an appetite even among the Democrats to do anything that I would count as meaningful criminal justice reform. Yeah, so no, obviously, you know, it's not that, it's not that uh, we, we want the Republicans in office, but we shouldn't kid ourselves in thinking that the mainstream of the Democratic Party is gonna deliver us, given the current political configurations, much yeah. of anything that we want. So. As a result, you know, like, let's look at what's going on in Atlanta, right, with Cop City. You've got an entirely Democratic local administration who's crushing resistance, is literally killing people for resisting, is bringing crazy conspiracy charges, and is suppressing people's right to vote. Uh, and it's an African-American Democratic administration. Yeah. So, you know, we have a bigger problem than the choice between two kind of neoliberal corporate parties. And the result of that for me strategically is that I have really doubled down on base building rather than uh, lobbying and policy advocacy in, in Washington or frankly even even at the state level. I do it some at the local level when there are sympathetic elected officials who I think really get it. But I think we have to change the facts on the ground. Yeah. And the way we're gonna do that is through base building. So personally, you know, I'm working in LA County, I'm working in Memphis, I'm working here in New York City, you know, and I'm supporting struggles all over the country yeah. uh, in, in whatever ways I can. But I'm not spending a lot of time working with the, the mainstream civil rights organizations, the lobbyists in Washington, even though, you know, I have friends there and I, and I have people who, who I think un have the right analysis, but I just don't see the point right now in investing a lot of energy in, in federal policy making uh, because we're just not going to get anywhere. So let's let's change the facts on the ground so that more people like Cory Bush can run for election and get elected. And to Alex's point about getting folk like Cory Bush elected and what I mean by we can work with these people, I recently helped support Cory Bush in the Unlock the Box campaign with their end solitary confinement act they recently introduced. I want to be very clear. F out, it's, it's, these in Atlanta should be f***ing ashamed for them, of themselves because it's all n it's all niggas out here running the game for this cop city shit, right? So like, make no mistake, that is a problem, that is a challenge. But also make no mistake, if the white woman would have won over Andre Dickens um, over here, out here in Atlanta, if Atlanta had a fully white um, administrative body to go along with the fully white corporate uh, overseers, it wouldn't even have been a question. They would have. They, it wouldn't even have been a. It wouldn't even have been a a, a a chance to even engage with it. The one thing I'll give the sent the anti Democrat sentiment is that it lulls to sleep. Yeah. Right. It lulls to sleep. Dickens, who I voted for Dickens in here in Atlanta, right? Because um, it was between him 
and a clearly pro cop black woman. Like I, 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 you know, I love y'all, but y'all be getting away with some shit in the political arena. No, I so, some carceral shit. Right, some carceral shit. It, it was between him and an explicitly pro cop, pro cop black woman running for mayor in Atlanta after like all seventy five of the other people got out the races. Atlanta's weird, um, and so I voted for him. I didn't vote for him with the spirit of like. You know, this is the revolution started here in Atlanta. I voted for him because I was the best person for the job. But if another, if if the pro cop woman would have won, they'd have they'd have shot more than one protester in that forest. You feel me? Yeah. Like like the the whole this is a this is a uh, equation. This is a mat. There are massive elements to all of these political actions and movements. Oh no no that was the, what I was trying to get at is and so he got into office. And a lot of niggas went to sleep. They went yeah. back to sleep, right? And so he's been running this game on Cop City. He got it. I'm, I don't know what check he got or where the checks are going. We know that Coca-Cola and Lockheed and all these people are paying $30 million and the city's paying $60 million, so I don't know where that $30 million is going. You know, don't clip me too much on shit like that because I don't know what's, what's going to get used. But my point is, if fell asleep when we got the right mayor in, then after you finish voting, it's your job to wake back up. I'll just say the effect that my voice can have on local Atlanta politics explicitly tied to the fact that they share identities with me. Yeah. The fact that they can't just look at me and say, oh, this, this, you know, saying, you know how they are, or these guys don't, or they can't do that to me. I went to the same school as some of these. N-s. I got the same background as some of these. N-s. I look like some of these, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, like, so we all are fundamentally a part of similar groups. They can't just push me aside and call it the woke mind virus or whatever the f- uh, Ron DeSantis is talking about. Uh, fun- so like that serves a functional, there's a functional use to that in terms of actually advocating for the politics I, I need and want. You saw in freaking, what was that, Tennessee, where the brothers stood up and tried to do something about gun violence and they just said, y'all not rep- y'all not uh, representatives anymore? Yeah. We voted, y'all yeah. Yeah. And that's, hey, hey. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? And don't get me wrong, like, it's, it's shit going on. Like, right, the, the Cop City petition that just ended, right? They're using, they're, they're, they're using signature verification systems. The Democrats in Atlanta are using signature verification systems that they refuse to use during the election. So these snakes. Yeah. They're snakes. I get it. I get what y'all are about to say, that they're no different on X, Y, and Z levels. But I have the capacity to critique that with a whole different, to a whole different level based on the fact that they are in, not in community, what's the word I want to use here? That we are, that there is a, there, there is at least an ostensible, they're at least ostensibly beholden to my political project. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and that does not happen if um, the random white lady that keeps on running for mayor in Atlanta is in office. You know what I'm saying? If the Republicans get control, they can easily just say, these 13% of the population, these don't vote anyway. I don't give a yeah. fuck what y'all got to say. If you have made it to the end of the video, I just want to express to you how truly exhausted I am. Oh my God, a bitch is tired. This was a wow undertaking that has taken me months to complete. And my closing thoughts are very similar to my opening thoughts. There is no one size fits all strategy or approach to voting or what you should do. These are just the informed thoughts of me and a bunch of other people I know. I hope you were able to derive something valuable from it. And remember what I said, Take what you find valuable and discard the rest. I hope those of you with the right to vote choose to exercise it and extra points if you exercise it against fascism. If not, I'll settle for you liking and sharing this video as well as following your girl on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Substack, Chow, some f- Subscribe in here, baby. Subscribe here. Thank you so much, y'all, for watching all of this. Hey. You know, I think it's always right Raheem make a little appearance for y'all at the end of these long videos. I also think that I want to... I want to recommend charities now to y'all. So please follow Be The Reason Charity on Instagram. That's BTR Charity. It's one of my good friends made this charity. He's just trying to spread positivity and do things. So give the page a follow on Instagram. Donate money, whatever you want to do. Let's help us do positive things in the neighborhood, child. Amy, say hi.